Okay, I have 6.30, so I'd like to convene this February 17, 2022 meeting of the Board of Directors of the San Lorenzo Valley Water District. Um, Holly, would you take the roll, please? President Mayhood? Here. Vice President Henry? Here. Director Ackman? Here. Director Fultz? Here. And Director Smalley? Here. Are there any additions or deletions to the agenda? Staff has none, Chair. Sure. Okay. Um, at this point, we are at this time for oral communications from members of the public on items that are under the purview of the district but are not on tonight's agenda. Are there any um, oral communications from the public? I see we do have seven attendees. Um, so go ahead. Uh, if any of you would like to address us now, please raise your hand. I don't see anybody. Um, so with that, we'll go ahead and um, move to the president's report. And um, I would like to call on Jamie to give a short report in my stead. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to share with the uh, board that um, recently I had an opportunity to meet with uh, Congressman Jimmy Panetta on a separate issue. Um, but while we were meeting, I invited him to come to the water district and take a tour of the uh, fire damage facilities and the pro progress that we've made in terms of recovery. And today he came out and took that tour. Um, so we were really pleased to, to host him at the Lions Water Treatment Facility, uh, where we talked about everything under the sun from what we are doing in terms of fire recovery and the burden that we are facing to the mergers that we are taking on with our uh, local uh, smaller water utilities that are also devastated by the fire. And, um, you know, we had a really good opportunity to talk about the issues that San Lorenzo Valley Water District views as sort of critical in the next couple of years. He was a great listener. I know he's been, you know, out making the rounds in the valley trying to sort of understand our issues because uh, we are going to be part of the district he runs for uh, in 2022. So we were really pleased to have him. Um, Rick, you and Carly and um, the rest of the staff that was out there supporting it did a great job. Um, really appreciate that. And Gail, thank you so much for making the um, time to be there. I know it was a little last minute. That's the way these things usually come together, but your presence there to talk about Santa Margarita was really important. And in fact, um, I heard from somebody that he met with later that he was still thinking about the Santa Margarita when he was talking with them. So thank you. Good. All right. And thank you especially for organizing it. Um, if there are no objections, uh, when we move to new business, I'd like to reverse the order of the two items um, and take up the revenue stabilization rate um, discussion first, uh, because that's much shorter and um, Kendra, uh, after we have that discussion, then we can uh, excuse Kendra so she doesn't have to spend the rest of the evening with us, um, if, that, if that's okay with everybody. Um, so, Rick, did you want to start on that? Sure, thank you, uh, Chair. Chair, we are uh, continuing to analyze the district uh, expenditures and revenue forecast, uh, which have been changing as we consider the timing of capital projects, water consumption trends, grant funding scenarios and the like. Uh, as a result, staff is not ready to present this item to the board and make a recommendation at this time. Um, we will continue to analyze the fiscal impacts of uh, the low water consumption. And we would like to revisit uh, this analysis with the budget and finance committee before coming back to the board with any recommendations. Okay. Um so Kendra is here also to answer any questions if ever, any members of the uh, board want to um, ask about this. I, I, are there any questions from members of the board? Go ahead, Bob. Yes, I, I might be confused. I thought this was voted on already in the budget committee and unanimously recommended that we move forward with it. Or, or did I read that wrong? No, you read that correctly. So, um, what changed? What, what's what's different now? What are the key financial items that have changed between the budget committee meeting, which was how long ago? A couple weeks? Three weeks? 
and, and today. I, I'm I'm not sure I'm following you. Yeah, I, I'll take that, Gail. Um, since the budget and finance meeting, uh, whoa, and consumption is increasing. Uh, some projects have uh, been put on hold by the state agency, by Caltrans. Um, we are also uh, looking at some late grant funding. It's, it almost changes daily, Bob, with you know putting together and reviewing our projects consumption. And we're just not yeah, quite so we're just not quite ready yet to come back, and uh, we want to look at it again before we take that final step of raising rates. So yeah, we're we're usually probably a month or two behind you guys in terms of behind staff in terms of seeing consumption trends because you know we just get the reports and arrears. Um, well, we're so, seeing production. We're seeing an increase in production because we don't have those consumption reports yet either, Bob. But we're oh, seeing okay. an, an increase in in production with this warmer weather. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it has been uh, warmer. Um, in terms of the grants, are those grants then able to be used to offset regular operating expenses? Not operating. I mean, are, are these capital projects going to be going away or are they just being delayed? Being delayed. Caltrans has delayed the, the two bridge replacement projects. So okay. if, if, you, if you'll let me just jump in here, Rick, these are these are just the kinds of delays that because of Caltrans or other things that are, they're not our choice, but because they're being delayed, they're not going to hit this fiscal year. And so rather than come through with um, a recommendation to implement revenue stabilization rates right now, the thought was to do a thorough uh, budget review uh, for the, the second year of the biennial budget and reassess at that point. But largely this is triggered by the fact that we had a a very dry January and a warm February. So we're sort of hoping that consumption goes up a little bit and um, that we will be able to meet those um, revenue losses uh, that we've already experienced, which we can't do anything to get the money back um, by but things that we've already discussed um, already. I, I will say that Rick did run this by both Lois and I, um, so it's it's not that this is a surprise to us. It's just that some things changed. Well, surprise to me. So maybe maybe not others. Um, so just last question before, because I know Jamie and Mark want to go, and I'll I'm I'd like to come back after them. Um, are, are we still in the middle of a drought? I mean, do we really want consumption to go back up? given we're in the middle of a drought? We are still in a drought condition. However, at this time, there is available water, especially excess surface water. We are not, we are still 100% on uh, the district surface water throughout from our entire system. We do have water that is just going down basically to the ocean that, you know, we feel that it would be better served if our customers could get a break from, you know, the heavy drought program. And we were planning to reevaluate our drought contingency and most likely come back with a, a change in that to a more uh, voluntarily um, program. But that could change. I mean, you know, this is very fluid. The finances and our project status almost changes daily. Uh, we didn't. We had more information came in after the budget and finance meeting. We felt it would be better to regroup, do a more thorough budget review, and then go back to the uh, finance committee, and then bring it back to the board. Okay, Mark. So, um, when are we going to? talk about this 
because it was significant enough uh, to put it onto the agenda for tonight. But now we're uh, go reevaluate. Is this uh, at the next board meeting for March? Or are you thinking further than that, Rick? I'm thinking most likely the, the second meeting in March. So a month a month from now. Correct. Okay. Um, I, I would encourage that rather than continue to uh, hope think I'm hoping things are going to get better. So I'm going to delay discussing what is the potential negative news that we need to discuss as a board then. So that's Jamie. It. Thanks. Um, I just want to sort of try and encapsulate what I'm hearing. I, I, I think what I'm hearing from you, Rick, is that while we acknowledge that we're in drought conditions and we certainly don't want to encourage overconsumption, right now there is a certain percentage of water that if not used is going to be lost to us anyway because we don't have a way to store it. Um, and so if uh, consumption is going up and people are using that and that is a way to offset the need for revenue stabilization, or at least put it off for a bit, um, then we're going to allow that because we want to one, you know, delay increasing people's rates to stabilize the rates if we have to, and two, we want to try and use water that we would lose anyway. Is that is that what you're trying to say, Rick? That's that's you know that's probably it in a nutshell, so to speak. You know, we we targeted our drought program to outside water use. There isn't a lot of outside water use right now, although we have seen an increase in production. You know, we haven't seen the consumption records for um, uh, for February yet. So we're basing this uh, on an increase uh, in consumption. Um, so, and with the reevaluation of projects from other sources, not the district staff, you know, we didn't uh, pull back any projects on our own accord. Caltrans has made these changes. We're looking at our budget and where we should be if all the projects were moving forward. Um, you know, we're, we're still have a very healthy capital improvement program. We're still moving ahead. Um, I'm just not ready. I, I mean, I, I, I believe we should look thoroughly and if things change between one meeting and the next, we should take a very close look at that before I recommend a rate increase. Okay, I'd like to go. It's a last uh, oh, sorry, I'm sorry, Rick, I didn't. No, that's okay. Jamie, just, did you wanna, Jamie, did you want to follow up? Or you, okay. Um, I'd like to go out to members of the public. Um, well, I'll, well I'll, oh, Lois, did you want to say something? I'm sorry. Lois, yeah. did you want to comment? I want to say something. Sure, please do. I um, really didn't want to do this uh, rate stabilization because I know how unpopular it was in 2017. Uh, and, but I, I looked at all the numbers that we were given and having worked with, with uh, people and their debts and that type of thing, I realized that if we get in a hole, it's hard to get out. And I said that at the meeting, I don't know if that influenced people, but um, I, I'm glad we're not doing this right now. And, but I think we need to be careful. And um, I, I absolutely know how angry people were in 2017. That was the wildest meeting I've ever been to. And let's just be careful here and make sure we're taking the right path. And I'm worried about the drought also. Thank Back you. to you. Thank you. Uh, let's go out to the members of the public. I see Cynthia has her hand up. Let's um, allow Cynthia to speak, please. Uh, 
Hi, good evening. Um, so my understanding, I think, is that if we use more water now when it's available, because we're on septics, that water will go into the ground. So in effect, it's being stored in our septic systems or in the ground uh, and gets recycled back into our surface water sources rather than just flowing down the river. Um, I know that we can't pump raw water up to the northern system. Is that correct? That we are treating the water first and then sending it up to Boulder Creek? But it seems like that's also a strategy for keeping the water in the valley rather than letting it go to the ocean. I know it's not efficient, but I think that's what I understand Rick saying. Thank you. Rick, did you wanna give a quick well, response to that? Just to clarify, you know, we do have Foreman Creek back in the system after the fire, we immediately went in and did an emergency installation of the pipeline. So our Lion Water Treatment Plant from Foreman Creek is producing uh, the bulk of the water and then Fall Creek is all uh, uh, supplying water more towards, uh, you know, it's supplying, supplying all of Felton and then some of Van Loman. But predominantly right now we are on uh, Foreman Creek. And then as you know, Clear Creek, uh, Sweetwater Creek um, are not uh, being utilized at all right now due to damage from the CZU fire. It's just that 10 inches of rain, you know, really gave us runoff. And San Lorenzo Valley water does not really have any raw water storage. We have aquifer storage uh, in our aquifers, but as far as uh, surface water storage, we treat and it goes right into the distribution system. We have no real storage, so to speak, for surface water. And we don't move raw water up the valley. We can only move treated water. Thank you for that clarification, Rick. Um, are there any other comments from the public? Okay, seeing none, I'll come back uh, to the board. Bob, did you wanna comment further? Yes, um, thanks. Just a, a, a couple of things. So it sounds, Rick, if I'm, if I'm hearing you right, that what you may wanna do is refine our ordinance to perhaps suspend drought or conservation during times when we are on predominantly or completely surface water, um, or at least tamp it down a little bit. So in other words, our community would sort of get into the mode of, well, if we're on surface, we know we can use more water. If we're on wells, we know we can. Is that kind of where I'm hearing you're going? You know, that that's what you're hearing, but that's a very tough, uh, that's tough to get that word out to your customers and get your customers to switch back and forth. People get into a pattern on their water use, and then it gets tough to know when we have surface water or when we don't. Um, you know, under normal rainfall, you could take, uh, you could definitely take, uh, you know, the, the winter months and easily do that, but then we wouldn't be in the drought under normal rainfall. It's very difficult to try to have, uh, to get the message out and have your customers, and it gets really confusing to customers if you don't stick to uh, a water use pattern. And what we should be doing is evaluating and rolling back probably to, to what we call a phase one. It was just, you know, always use water wisely and conserve and then go back. And it's good that we move this around a little. So our customers, you know, that our customers, as you know, Bob do a, a tremendous job uh, in water conservation uh, with very little reward. Uh, so th this would be a time and we have the surface water that people could, um, you know, use some more water if need be. But as you know, people get into patterns and once they get into a strong conservation, they usually stay, even so uh, water is available. So that's a tough message to get across to your customers. No, I understand. We could we could put something on the website, you know, up in the top right or something to indicate uh, or through our social media. Um, but I, I understand your concern because historically our customers, once they conserve water, 
they don't really go back to the old patterns of consumption. It might inch up a little bit, but it doesn't go up very much. And so I think the other question is, is 10% reduction that we've seen going to be um, permanent? The other question I wanted to ask was about impact uh, on fish. So I think I'm also hearing you say that if we pull more water out of Foreman, um, that's sort of offset by the fact we're not pulling any out of Clear Creek. And so there shouldn't be any real impact to the fish and environment, that sort of thing this time of year, uh, if we were to do that. And P Vine, we're not pulling all the water out of Foreman either. There's a lot of water that Yeah, goes no, I know, I know. So yeah, I uh, yes, we, we believe so. Okay, well, the last thing I want to mention is that, you know, delays in spending capital if the project doesn't go away is not a savings. It's a, it's a deferral. Um, the number that I look at in terms of our financial health is our operating margin. And if our operating margin is going down because expenses stay the same or go up and operating revenue is going down, we are not doing anything other than kicking the can down the road on those capital expenditures. That is something that previous boards have done for decades, and it has gotten us to where we are millions of dollars in the hole on unfunded capital obligations, not to mention projects that should have been done over the years that we're now trying to catch up on. I would strongly urge um, staff in this board to not allow us to continue down that same historical path. That is, that's sort of... Um, not a very prudent thing to do relative to our infrastructure and capital obligation and financial health. Um, so when you're looking at it over the course of the next month, please take that all into account and see if we can work on getting our operating margins back up to where they need to be. And Bob, I agree with you. And on the operating side, we do have one position uh, vacant that we are not planning on filling. So that is a, a true savings. And we still have not uh, hired the, the project manager, although we have some hopes that we're going to move forward on that. So there are some real savings in, in operating costs uh, currently. And, you know, Grant you, I, I, I'm very aware of past budgets and getting further and further behind on maintenance and, and replacement. But we do have a, a very strong capital improvement program in our budget still moving forward, not just the CZU, but a lot of capital improvement, much more than I think than any past boards um, have moved, moved forward. And we are moving forward, as the board knows, with a lot of projects. Jamie? So um, thank you. Two, two points of clarification there. I just want to... Um, the, the the deferred operating costs that are related to um, you know any any grant spend that we have not spent down any project related spending I'm, I'm assuming that you what's happening there is that we when we are not moving forward with projects there are also attendant administrative and operating costs that we're not spending to support those projects and so we're receiving savings on both ends is that a fair way to sort of characterize that Rick it is, Jamie, but it's a small percentage of the project. You know, it'll be the operational crew assisting a, a, a contractor in tying over to new connections and, and working in the existing distribution system. But it's a small percentage. Um, you know, and, and we are looking at operational costs. It's just so tough when our operating costs are fixed costs, power, uh, you know, gasoline for vehicles, vehicle maintenance. I, it's, you know, internet services. I mean, it's, I wish we had, you know, operating costs that we could go in and just cut that wouldn't impact our abilities to um, supply water. And, you know, and then in my opinion, that's what the problem is. If we did start making, you know, op, you know large operational cuts, it's definitely going to impact our abilities. Right, right. Um, and then, you know, my second question, and that was really related to your comment about um, the the increase that we've seen in water consumption. Um, do we have any sense, because it is interesting that we're seeing an increase in February, even though it's been a warmer February, because as you said, there's not a lot of outdoor water usage at this time of year typically. So 
I, I wouldn't think people would just like run out and turn on their sprinklers because it was a couple of warm days, but maybe they do that. So I'm wondering, is that what is that what the increase in usage is or um, or, you know, is there something else that we can point to um, when we see increased usage like at this time of year? Really can't, you know, put my finger on any one, but I, I can tell you our water consumption is directly related to the to the weather. Um, you know, these sunny days, uh, people are using more water here and there. It's not obviously not like the summer season when people are putting gardens in. But, you know, as we drive around the valley, we see a lot of people out working in their yards. They're cleaning, there's pollen, there's wind. You know, people are out doing things, and when they're outside, they do use water. Um, so, um, you know, and that could change. We got rain coming next week, um, and, you know, Director Foltz possibly could be right on by thinking, our water usage may not come back to our projected. Then we're going to have to do some serious hard decisions. Thanks, Rick. Bob. Yeah, just just one other question for Rick on the on the production side. I think in the past you'd mentioned that when we get into a drought or a very dry situation, that we tend to see a little bit more increase in water loss due to shifts in the infrastructure. Is that a possibility here as well? Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure about that, Bob. I, I had to think about that one. I, I know when, when the ground dries out, leaks tend to surface. We find more leaks, but I'm not sure um, if that, uh, you know, we're going to look in, uh, the engineering committee is going to look into water loss uh, unaccounted for water and leak detection. Um, on that, you know, we definitely know that, and we haven't took a good look. We definitely know that taking uh, the redwood tanks that we've taken offline, probation, Lumpico, et cetera, have reduced that water loss. Um, you know, so, and as we move ahead, we still have several redwood tanks in the process. None of our redwood tank pro um, projects that are in the budget, um, they're still moving uh, ahead in the engineering. Uh, stages, um, et cetera, um, and there'll be more water savings there. Um, but we haven't really pulled those numbers to get into that, and we will be doing that you know, mid-year. Okay. Great, thanks. Um, let's go ahead and go on to our next uh, order of new business, which is a presentation on the alternatives for cross-country pipeline replacement. Rick? Yes, and uh, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Jeff uh, Tarantino to introduce um, a fabulous engineering team and present uh, uh, this uh, presentation to the board. Jeff? Uh, thank you, Rick, and uh, thank you, uh, Director, for having us here to kind of walk through what we've been doing in the last several months with the team. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, and then um, we'll, we'll take this into some introduction for you. Bear with me for a second. How I do this? All right. So um, again, I'm Jeff Tarantino with Fryer and Loretta. We are the, uh, the the lead engineer for for the team that has been supporting the district and performing the capability study. Um, I have three key key members of our team with me tonight. I'm going to go ahead and have them uh, introduce themselves, and so I'll just call out your name, and you guys can just uh, introduce yourselves and just. Uh, provide your role in the project. So first, uh, Justin. Hi, everyone. Justin Simeon with WRA. I've been helping with uh, CEQA and permitting. I've uh, been doing this work for about 20 years in the Bay Area now. So, Thanks, Justin. So, yep. uh, Mark? Hi, I'm Mark Myers with Cal Engineering and Geology and um, so I'm helping with uh, geologic and geotechnical interpretation uh, along the uh, pipeline locations, and then also just have experience with retaining walls and other stuff that I'm helping the team with. Great. Thank you, Mark. And finally, Aaron. Hi, everyone. Uh, Aaron Smud. I'm with Alpine Summit Development, and my role in the project has mostly been focused on constructability review, you know, kind of means and methods, uh, as well as, you know, kind of preliminary budget cost estimating for construction. Great. Thanks, Aaron. 
And um, so the this team here has been working uh, together, you know, looking kind of at all components of uh, of the project, and really trying to leverage our our team's experience um, working in the Bay Area and really find and develop a, an alternative that seems to be the correct alternative to, to restore the cross country system. So um, first, we want to just uh, kind of do a quick look back at, at history. So as, as the, you know, the board's aware, and I'm sure many of the public, members of the public are aware, um, the, this, the operation of the cross-country pipeline system dates back to before 1914, the original logic um, When the uh, district was formed and uh, continued water use throughout the valley, um, you know, the, the creek diversions then began the plume system uh, around 1914. And, you know, continue to operate for several decades that way. Um, you know, the, the system was then improved in the, in the 1930s with the introduction of a stovepipe to, to, you know, within the flume. And, and then the, the, the 90s and the, the 80s, we, we, looked, we saw the construction of the cross-country pipeline with the HDP pipe um, laid on grade, uh, constructed over several years. Um, and, and the point of kind of talking about that is that, you know, the, the cross-country system always changes. You know, changing the, the, the technologies, um, taking advantage uh, of um, pipe materials, and, and really was operated reliably for, for nearly 30 years um, before it really went to a catastrophic event the season of fire. So, you know, we need to you know, continue to learn and, and see the benefits that the system had um, you know, throughout the, the last 30 years, but also obviously be very mindful of. Um, you know, the, what we have learned from the season of fire and, and you know, continue to, to look at other potential natural disasters that could impact long-term operational reliability of the system. So the CZU fire obviously was a, a very catastrophic event to, to the valley. Um, and it, it was something that um, was, was, a, was a hard lesson for all of us to learn about um, the, you know, the changing environment. Um, the, the San Lorenzo Valley Water District team was working in real time with, with the first responders to really, you know, understand and react to the, the, the intense season of fire. Um, what, we, what we learned after the fact is that there was irreparable damage to the, to the cross country pipeline system. So portions of the pipeline were lost, um, portions of the pipeline were, were damaged, and essentially the system was not functioning. And we, we talked about in the previous item. You know, the district has restored the foreman, um, uh, the foreman diversion structure and the foreman pipeline uh, to allow the district to, to have partial operations. But, you know, our study really focused on how can we restore both Devon and Providence. So, and so, you know, as a consequence of the CZU fire, uh, there's a, a substantial vegetation in the forest. Um, this is, you know, in the immediate term, in the immediate um, aftermath, you know, was um, you know created dangerous situations, you know, allowed limited access to, to the watershed to really understand the extent of the damage that occurred. Um, but it will also lead to long-term uh, challenges and risks that um, you know not, not only in the, in the next several years, but but maybe in, in years to come that we we need to understand and recognize and, and plan for um, as we as we think about reconstructing the, the cross-country pipeline system. So. You know, tree falls, um, landslides, debris flows, you know, these are all hazards that um, the, the team with the district have thought through and, and really tried to develop um, alternatives to, to think about all those potential um, risks uh, that face the long-term uh, operations and, and resiliency of the, the cross-country pipelines. So one of the first things we did with district staff was really sit down and think about you know, the overall goals of the project. Obviously, most critically, restoring the, the canal system. Um, that's that's the you know goal number one um, in order to 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 bring the sea water, clear green, um, and divine uh, diversions back online in, in, in reasonable time frame. But uh, like we talked about, we also needed to apply lessons learned and experience um, from the CZU fire and, and the aftermath to to inform. Um, what other goals, what other, what other um, project criteria should we be thinking about as we develop alternatives? You know, we want to think about- Jeff, Jeff yes. could I interrupt for a minute? Um, yes. your, your sound is a little fuzzy and- Oh, it um, is. I think for some people it might be cutting in and out a little bit. I don't know. 
if you can move the microphone or do something different. Yeah, let me stop my video. Um, great. No, I, I, I agree. I think it's a microphone issue, maybe whatever you're using. Is this better if I, if I'm, can you hear me better now? A little. It, it's just, a, it's not the best quality, but um, that is louder. That is louder. Okay. I mean, apologies. Let me stop my share. Let's see. I'll stop my video now. Hopefully that helps and I'll hold the microphone closer um, uh, to me. So hopefully that's a little bit better. Not really. <laughs> Not really. Okay. Um, We're just going to power through it, though. You're, you're doing okay. great. <laughs> okay. Apologies for that. I could uh, take a break here and try to call my phone. A little bit better, so apologies for that. Okay. So, you know, one of the things that we also want to think about is the overall operation and resiliency of the system. Thinking about what enhancements or improvements with the reconstructed system that we should um, incorporate in order to uh, improve the overall resiliency and reliability as we can think about changing environment, changing you know, the frequency of wildfire, those types of conditions. We also have to recognize that you know, today is a much different in, in time for construction and permitting of, of work uh, than it was you know, even, even 10 or 20 years ago. So thinking about the stakeholders, um, you know, whether it's FEMA, whether it is California Fish and Game, you know, the other agencies that um, are going to have a very high interest in, in, in the reconstruction of this project so that we are, you know, meeting, you know, a multitude of stakeholder requirements when delivering the final project. And finally, we have an opportunity to incorporate green energies, you know, thinking about hydropower. How can we uh, continue to improve the overall operation, thinking about operating costs and where there may be opportunities to take advantage of um, of, of green infrastructure to, to offset, um, to, to some extent, um, operate. So one of the first things we did was work, working with district staff as we spent uh, several days walking both the Evine and the Five Mile Stake. Um, we wanted to really kind of get firsthand uh, um, eyes on what, what the existing conditions were uh, take the opportunity to talk with district staff about the experience, both you know, immediately as the fire was happening, the aftermath of the fire, but also kind of learn about what challenges the operation staff had even before the fire in just accessing and operating um, both the Vine and the Five Mile Safe. Um, so one of the things that we did walking through was you know, you know, kind of observe that you know, when we took up the key Vine segment, what we found was you know generally you know reasonably wide benches. Um, Usable access uh, to the watershed. There was, you know, obviously uh, damage and debris from the fire. But what we found was that the Peavine branch um, was going to, you know, probably uh, pose uh, fewer challenges uh, than the Five Mile branch. And so we, we really wanted to kind of think about, you know, as we as we develop the solution um, and develop alternatives and, and phasing for the project. You know what opportunities does the existing conditions in the Peavine segment really provide for for initial success of the project? So when we visit the five mile segment, we you know we found you know, much different conditions. Um, you know, steeper hillsides um, along along um, the five mile. We actually found damaged pipe that was still in place. That you know something that we'll have to consider uh, during reconstruction of, of portions of the system. And, and we found you know, generally more challenging conditions um, for, uh, for reconstructing the, the five mile segment. So when you have just some more photos, again, steep hillsides, um, you have sl sloughing, you know, you know, a lot of different conditions that we wanted to really kind of get our arms around a little better. So as we think about, you know, not only just what can we do in selecting an alternative that improves overall hardening for fire, wildfire protection, but also thinking about other natural natural conditions um, that that we want to make sure that we accommodate in the design uh, to to improve the overall hardening of the system. So with that, Justin is going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the environmental review that we've done to date and, uh, and, and some thoughts on on next steps in terms of PM. So Justin. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. So as, as part of that existing conditions review that Jeff mentioned, uh, we went 
along uh, on that site block and uh, reviewed the entire alignments for both the Peavine and the five mile uh, pipelines and for things like special status species habitat presence, um, any sensitive habitats, uh, wetlands, uh, creeks, but also sensitive habitats as they're uh, de defined and designated by CDFW uh, for CEQA purposes. Um, and so one of the first things to, to go over is just the list of uh, agencies involved in uh, permitting a project like this. These are all um, agencies that we've identified as, as having a stake in the reconstruction of the, the two pipelines. Uh, it's a pretty typical suite of agencies uh, for the Bay Area, especially when it concerns water projects. Uh, I did want to note that we uh, included uh, CAL FIRE in the assessment, as well as FEMA as well. Uh, these are the, the, the primary agencies here listed on this slide that are going to have the most to say about the project, uh, we think, though. Uh, you can go on to the next slide, Jeff. Uh, so the key uh, factors when it comes to the environment uh, for these pipelines are schedule <clears throat> stream crossings and, and redwood forest impacts. Uh, schedule uh, the list of agencies on the previous slide that it's pretty typical to to uh, for those to require at least a year for all of those agencies to get through their respective permitting processes. Um, we also have uh, breeding birds and other seasonal restrictions that we'll need to follow, so that we're, we're making sure that we're minimizing uh, impacts to the environment as the construction is proceeding. Uh, stream crossings. Uh, there are many stream crossings uh, along the alignment. Uh, I think we totaled uh, you know, about 17 or so uh, creek crossings uh, with both uh, seasonal, ephemeral, and perennial uh, drainage streams uh, all along the alignment. Uh, and then with those stream crossings and the agency permitting process, uh, you bring also some uh, risk of potential op for operational impacts related to diversions and the uh, amount of water that can be diverted through those, uh, through those uh, diver existing diversions that would be reconstructed. Um, in addition, we have the uh, potential for redwood forest impacts. Um, nobody wants to see redwood trees removed. Um, in this case, we would be limiting the tree removal to uh, trees that are really necessary in order to facilitate the direct construction access and then also for safety purposes as well. Um, it would, it's important that uh, we don't have a, a tree falling, especially after a recent fire event uh, on, uh, in the middle of a construction crew while they're doing work out there. Um, so those were the key environmental concerns that we identified as part of that jurisdictional assessment. Um, we also reviewed potential CEQA options. And Jeff, you can go on to the next slide. Um, and I'll start out by saying that this, you know, we've had preliminary discussions with the district about all of these options. Uh, we haven't made any decisions yet in terms of what uh, the preferred pathway forward might be for CEQA. Um, so we did review the emergency statutory exemption under CEQA, and it could apply to either of these projects. Um, it, it's uh, applicable to projects implemented in response to natural, natural disasters and uh, does allow for uh, time needed to complete technical studies, construction drawings, and the like. Uh, in order to uh, get make a project move forward. Uh, the, our intent uh, that we've in our recommendation, I guess, is to you know, move if we if that pathway was selected, 
move forward with the technical studies that would be done with either of the other two uh, CEQA pathways, follow all of the avoidance minimization measures that you would otherwise uh, need to follow if you went through those other pathways. Uh, the, the primary advantage uh, for that statutory exemption is a schedule advantage. Um, you can see down at the bottom of the slide, for if, if we're looking at a, a goal of reestablishing the P-vine alignment uh, by with construction starting in 2023, uh, the statutory exemption could get us there. The main reason for that is because the uh, statutory exemption would not require any public review. Um, and that, that in itself does carry some risks. Um, it's not always a very popular thing to move forward with a project without allowing the, uh, the public a chance to comment on the CEQA document, but it is that process, that, that is the reason that, that, that the exemption could move forward more quickly than the others. Um, the uh, public review process is valuable, but it's also time consuming. Uh, and so the statutory exemption gets the project to construction sooner than the other two pathways. Um, the other, other two being the uh, initial study and mitigated negative declaration pathway. Um, this is applicable if impacts, all impacts can be mitigated to a level that's less than significant. Uh, it's more easily legally challenged as compared to an environmental impact report um, I should say that you know, all of these options, including this, the exemption, do have the, the carrier risk of, of litigation. Uh, the environmental impact report is the strongest uh, defense against potential litigation. So those, those are all factors that we'll be uh, continuing to review uh, with the district. And um, you know, if, if uh, you know, it's, it's a decision that is going to have to be made relatively quickly. Uh, to meet, if, if we want to meet the uh, desired construction dates. Uh, so that's, oh, I should, uh, last, last is the bullet down at the bottom that I should definitely uh, be sure to mention is that both the, the P-Vine and the five mile alignments are separate projects for CEQA purposes. They don't have to be reviewed together and they don't have to use the same uh, CEQA process and pathway, CEQA compliance pathway. We could process one under a statutory exemption and do an EIR for the other. Um, it's either because they are separate projects, they have independent utility, they both function independently and don't rely on each other. Um, so that's the summary of the CEQA uh, side of things. And pass it back to Jeff. Great, thank you, Justin. Hopefully everybody can hear me better. I have switched to a different microphone. So hopefully that's better. Yeah, I see Mark shaking his head. Okay, great. So apologies for the audio issues. So, um, but you know, one of the reasons why we wanted to review kind of the, you know, at the early part of our of our efforts, the the jurisdictional assessments, thinking about CEQA was it, it's gonna, you know, it was gonna be an informative process as we think about, you know, alternative development and evaluating those alternatives for, for constructing a, a, a replacement cross country system. And so we we had uh, proposed to the district um, under our original original proposal to to follow what we call the, uh, a goals based risk evaluation process. So we wanted to think about um, how, how can we best uh, develop an alternative, uh, evaluate that alternative's ability to deliver a project that meets the overall needs of the, uh, of the, of the district of restoring, you know, the raw water conveyance system, providing a more resilient, more hardened system, um, and, and do it in a timely manner. And so as we, as we think about um, the process to, to kind of get to a proposed alternative, the first thing that we, we did with the district was we, we established evaluation criteria. We wanted to think about, you know, in the context of overall goals of the project, what type of criteria would, would allow us to, to best evaluate each alternative, thinking about both, you know, potential for success and associated risks with any given alternative. Um, the, the following this process of kind of developing this, this evaluation criteria that informs the development of alternatives and ultimately 
feeds into the overall evaluation and recommendation process is it, it allows us to kind of do a great job of documenting what, what we've been doing, a document the thought process that we go through as a technical team with support with the um, you know, heavy involvement of district staff as we thinking about going into the CEQA process um, that, that we'll talk about kind of at the, uh, you know, some more uh, during the question and answer sense of session. So, so it's really important um, as we develop these alternatives and come up with a, with a preferred al uh, alignment for, for consideration by the district that we have a, a robust documentation and kind of a, a detailed process that, that, that supports the, the um, recommend recommendation proposal. So we, we met with the district after our site assessment and after the jurisdictional assessment to, to really kick off this, this goal-based risk assessment process. Um, one of the things that was um, important as a group, both the technical team and district staff, was really to kind of talk about the overall goals of the project. You know, we, we think about, um, uh, when we think about the, the, the goal of the project, think about statements, you know, kind of concepts, you know, three to four words or ideas that really would influence um, uh, the, the overall goal and that allows to kind of evaluate whether we have identified a successful project. And once we establish those goal words, um, thinking about what the potential success factors, what, what part of a project component would, would uh, allow us to meet, successfully meet that goal, but also what are the challenges, what are the risks associated with any, any given alternative, any component of an alternative that would you know, adversely impact the, the successful completion of the project. And, you know, we, we use this process um, to really, you know, engage district staff to, to learn more about, you know, what, what they're hearing from, you know, the board level, from the members of the public, from other stakeholders about what's important to, to, for us to consider as we develop potential alternatives. And so once we think about establishing goal statements, establishing risk and success factors, that then allowed the technical team to to kind of go back and and develop potential alternatives to present to the district for their feedback before we started performing the evaluation process. So, you know, the first step, as I said, was we we met as a group. We we spent a couple hours as a, as a team with district staff to establish goal statements. So on the left hand side, there are you know in discussions with with the team thinking about kind of the key. Um, criteria, key thoughts, key concepts, I'll say, of, of what would be a goal of a project, you know, safety, you know, knowing that that's a real critical goal and, and, and focus of the board um, in everything that the district does. But also thinking about constructability, you know, how can we develop an alternative and implement a solution um, that, um, you know, minimizes construction risks. I mean, we're never going to eliminate them, but minimize those risks, but also not just be focused on what we are doing to get the cross-country pipeline system restored, but also, you know, through uh, working with with the operate with the operators, you know, what are the challenges that 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 they had um, operating the previous system? What are the challenges they perceive moving forward? You know, thinking about all those challenges so that we can develop a solution that that you know really considers not only the construction phase, but Quite frankly, the important part, the the, the operation phase, you know, the, the long-term operability and resiliency of the system. And and finally, and definitely not last and least, is you know, potential stakeholder impact. So thinking about stakeholders, um, you know, again, this is FEMA, this is um, the public, this is the customers, this is um, the environmental agencies, you know, kind of thinking about um, what what is important to each of those stakeholders and really considering that when when thinking about, you know, how we can have a successful project in the eyes of a permitting agency, but also thinking about, you know, what risks are associated with some of the um, environmental um, process and permitting and, and, and costs and things like that, that we're going to have to go through in order to develop a, a successful project. So, so once we, I, as a group, we established these, these concepts, we actually broke into four separate um, work groups. So a district team member, and then um, two or three technical team members, we work together in Israel work groups in order to establish the, the goal statements here that you see on the screen. So we wanted to make sure that, um, you know, as a technical team, we weren't just kind of off and doing our work and then coming back and 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 just presenting it to, to, to Rick and his team for kind of feedback. We wanted Rick and Josh and Carly and, and James to be part of the process. We wanted to, you know, involve them throughout the process so that we knew we were developing, um, you know, goals and, and kind of, you know, focusing on delivering a project that would be successful from 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 the, the district staff's perspective. 
So once we established the goal statement, um, the next the next fact the next step that we followed was thinking about those success factors, thinking about the factors that we could use um, in an evaluation process um, to determine how well um, an individual alternative can meet any any one of the four success factors here. And so that required us to go through and start selecting um, success criteria. So thinking about um, you know for for each one of these um, goal statements, you know what are the criteria that we can use to evaluate a potential alternative's ability to deliver a successful project. Um, and we wanted to make sure it was you know a a, um, a process that was um, uh, numerical. So we, we developed a, a ranking system. So you know the ability of a potential alternative to meet an individual success criteria on a scale. So one to ten scale, just you know one being you know, a very low likelihood that a, um, uh, a, a particular uh, alternative would meet a success criteria up all the way up to 10, which is a high likelihood. Um, and we wanted to think about, you know, these individual success criteria to think about different parts of the project, thinking about um, hardening of the system, thinking about um, improving operations of the system, and knowing that as you look at each component of a, of a particular alternative, um, you know, one alternative would 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 do well in one category, but now not, may not be do well in, in another category. So, for example, um, thinking about varied versus above ground HDB pipe. You know, HDB pipe installed above grade from a constructability perspective um, it was going to um, uh, you know be be better at achieving the goal of of, of restoring the project with a with a um, more straightforward construction process. But when you compare the buried HDPE versus uh, the um, above ground HDPE, um, when you think about natural disaster hardening, obviously the, the above ground uh, HDPE is, has a high risk of, of damage um, during a fire um, or in other, in other natural um, disasters. And so really thinking about how each potential project component ranks um, in, in terms of meeting those goals really allowed us to evaluate effectively how successful a particular alternative could be. So once we established the success factors, the work groups then thought about the risk factors. So, you know, what are those criteria, risk criteria that would adversely impact a project? Um, and so when we think about those, you know, um, again, in the context of the goal statement, what are different um, risk criteria that would affect a project's ability to, to meet the, um, uh, the the success. So, for example, thinking about FEMA funding was a, was was an important component of the constructability. You know, thinking about you know projects that restore um, as as best we can to, to similar conditions, but also thinking about um, you know from a safety perspective. You know, what what are if we're if we're not hardening and improving the project, what are those potential safety risks that we may be introducing um, over over time? So it really was an important for us working with district staff to, to kind of really establish kind of a range of those risk criteria to, to allow us to really think about, um, you know, the different um, um, risks that an alternative should try to address so that we could develop a series of alternatives that address each of these risks in a different manner to allow us to kind of um, understand and rank um, an individual alternative's ability to, to address the risk. You know, some one would be better than the other. So once we established our risk factors and our success factors, we then went through a process of looking at individual project components. So the first component we looked at was potential pipeline materials. So you know, standard raw water conveyance system. You know, there's really kind of four uh, different pipe materials um, that we that we look at. Um, PVC polyvinyl chloride is, a, is another type of plastic pipe, um, similar to HDPE in that it's, it's plastic um, and it is um, it's a commonly used um, material in raw water conveyance. Um, but we also wanted to think about other hardened, more hardened materials, so ductile iron, metal pipe, something that would be more resistant to fire if it was installed above grade, but also welded steel. Um, you know, these are these are materials that um, you know our team has used in a lot of different um, uh, environments before. And as we as we think about each one of those materials, we also wanted to think about the the you know the pros and cons of of those materials. And so, looking at the individual um, you know uh, pipe materials, one of the things that we found pretty quick um, when we grouped them into kind of the 
two plastic materials and the two metal materials, you know, looking at PVC and HTPE first, um, we found that, you know, there really wasn't a lot of difference um, between PVC and HTPE. Um, and quite frankly, you know, they're, they're, you know, HTPE would be a more appropriate material for, for the environment, um, given the, you know, the, the, the narrow benches, the kind of, you know, varying topography, um, PVC, although a plastic and light, and easy to move around, it's a stiff product. It's not something that would really um, do well in installation within within the watershed. So, so we kind of looked at both PVC and HP and said, okay, we're we're not going to continue forward with PVC. That that material kind of you know fell out uh, of the evaluation. So any alternatives will you know uh, HP will be part of the kind of the menu of project components that we'll use for developing project alternatives. We did the same thing with with ductile iron and welding steel. Um, the district uses ductile iron pretty routinely in your distribution system, so it's a material the district staff was really familiar with. Um, it, there were um, portions of, um, you know, the um, uh, cross-country pipelines that, that used ductile iron fittings, which had gaskets and things that were rubber. Um, and what we saw out there was the ductile iron fittings, the fittings themselves, didn't appear to be damaged. Um, but the rubber and the gaskets um, that, that really rely on when you put two pieces of pipe together or material for providing that seal um, was burned, it was gone. So when we think about um, using a pipe material that's an alternative to a plastic like HPE, so, so the pipe material itself is, is you know, inherently more resistant to fire damage, um, we, we found that the ductile iron actually would, would likely not perform as well as welded steel. So welded steel is, you know, is, is a pipe, the joints are welded together, there's no gasket, so it's, it's a material that if it were installed within the watershed of upgrade would generally be um, more, we, would, we believe would be more resistant to fire and, and um, you know, has lesser risk to fire damage than ductile iron. So, you know, through this kind of evaluation of the pipeline material, we, we decided to just move forward um, with HEB and welded steel. So once we kind of narrowed the types of pipe material that, that we were going to use for developing alternatives, we then looked at construction methods. So, you know, one of the things that um, we talked about as a team during our initial proposal development was, you know, how can we leverage the use of trenches technology? You know, you know as, as Justin said, you know, working in the watershed, thinking about um, impacts to redwood forest, we really wanted to carefully look at technology that would minimize the surface disruption uh, within the watershed. So on the left here, you'll see kind of standard construction methods, which is just a very typical excavation. You, you excavate a trench, you, you prepare the, the, the bed, you put the pipe in, and then you backfill it or you know, uh, above ground, you just create the bench and, and pull the pipe material on. So the, the, the standard construction methods of open trench and above ground, those both seem to be pretty reasonable um, options that we could carry forward for the alternatives evaluation. But um, there's several different types of trenches technologies um, that could be used in, in, in a project like ours in terms of uh, pipe diameter um, and, and uh, typical use. Um, horizontal directional drilling, boring jack, microtelling, these are all kind of different um, detailed um, uh, types of trenches technologies that, that are commonly used in um, pipeline construction. But each one of these trenches um, methods requires um, a reasonably significant area, flat work area. Um, there's a lot of equipment. So the image here on, on the screen here on the right, this is a, uh, a horizontal directional dr drilling. Um, example, so you have um, you have a, 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 a pit where you have dug a pit, it's where you're going to be pulling your pipe product in, and then you have on the other end of the, of the, of the run, the, the directional drilling machine that's actually drilling a, an initial hole, then pulling the pipe back through that hole. And so that there's a lot of challenges with it, you know, lay down area for stringing out enough pipe to make the operation efficient. Um, like I said, you know, flat areas for, for the equipment be able to get in. Um, there's also um, uh, you know, different um, waste materials that, that are generated during some of these processes that would have to be handled. So, so when we really thought about um, the potential for success for using trenches methods, we really found that you know, using it widely throughout the, the project was really not going to be uh, effective. Um, you know, it was going to, you know, quite frankly, in order to, to set up um, for any one of these trenches methods would probably require a significant amount of site prep and clearing um, that, you know, we would essentially be creating an impact that we were trying to avoid um, by moving to a trenches technology. So 
looking at and comparing these two methods, we, we felt, both, felt that trench list um, is really not going to be something that's going to be successfully used widespread. It could be looked at focused, and we could, we'll talk about that a little bit more at the end of the presentation, but thinking about um, what provides the best opportunity for success for construction, we're really focused on open trench and above ground installation of the pipeline. So once we determined um, the the best um, methods moving forward for construction, um, we looked at you know the, the actual installation methods. So really focused on you know two options, buried or above grade. Um, so when we think about the buried um, uh, option, um, we really only focus on HTPE. So um, the purpose of burying the pipe would to to provide additional resiliency to the pipe from primarily from from wildfires. Um, so as we as I talked about a couple slides ago, when we think about rubber steel pipe, it's the pipe itself was inherently um, resistant to to fire as compared to HTPE. So we said, okay, you know, if we're going to look at options for burying the pipe, we're only going to focus on HTPE. But when we think about potential opportunities for installing above grade, we wanted to consider both HDPE, similar to what was installed um, with the original system, to um, as well as uh, above grade rubber steel. So but again, each has their advantages and disadvantages. Um, you know, there's still um, the buried HPE, just going to require excavation, a little bit wider bench um, to, to facilitate that construction versus an above grade on HDPE, the lighter pipe. It's something that re would require smaller equipment. Um, but again, it's going to, you know, be potentially um, uh, uh, at risk of, of damage again if there's another wildfire. And then welded steel, you know, above ground would, although it's above ground, we're not going to be generating excavation spoils. It's a heavier pipe material. The equipment required to actually move the pipe, set it, weld it, um, it was going to require, you know, significantly wider benches. Um, so, so we wanted to identify kind of the, the installation techniques and the kind of the details, um, but we did carry forward all three of these, um, all three of these options. Uh, for um, for consideration as part of the alternatives. So one of the, and this is a discussion we had with the engineering committee was you know thinking about you know what is the right depth to bury pipe. So um, you know the the goal of burying HEV pipe is to provide additional protection against wildfires. So the, uh, the the technical team, the staff at WRA did a, did a lot of research and and we found some studies that um, um, provided the, the, the kind of a, the, the relationship between potential um, temperature and soil and uh, at, at given depths. And what this chart, the blue line is plotting is the, um, the, the temperature and measured temperature in soil at, at varying depth. So at the, on the left-hand side there, it's a very shallow bearing, you know, the, it's an inch, you know, you're seeing very elevated temperatures, you know, 750 degrees Fahrenheit. But what the studies that, that the WR team reviewed and found was um, because soil is not uh, very efficient at transmitting heat, um, we really see a significant drop off um, uh, as you get deeper and, and not very deep. I mean, and you start to see some really significant um, insulation from, from, from elevated temperatures. And so marked here um, in the, with the red X is our proposed buried depth of, of 18 inches. Um, so at least the studies we found, the, the literature that's available um, through, um, uh, uh, through through internet research, you know, the the, the estimated um, temperature at a depth of about 18 inches from a from a wildfire is, you know, on the order of about 100, 160, 170 degrees Fahrenheit. The other component that we did was we we spoke to pipe HEV pipe manufacturers. We really want to understand what are the potential performance uh, and, and, and risks associated with um, pipe, HP pipe being within fires. And so we found two things. First, I'll start at the kind of the top with that red dashed line, the, the, the temperature at which HP pipe will melt. So um, we found that the published information from the, from the pipe manufacturers and talking to manufacturers is, is right around about 400, uh, 480, 490 degrees Fahrenheit. So at that temperature, we get above that temperature, the pipe's going to melt, it's going to deform, it's going to, you know, basically, you know, what happened and what we observed it within the watershed is going to happen. But the other key component in this is, is what at what temperature do we start to see the potential for off-gassing? Um, so, you know, HEV pipe being a plastic, um, the material that it's constructed, 
you know, when it gets too hot, um, it, it has a potential um, for, for releasing um, uh, VOCs. Uh, and, and so the research that the um, manufacturer shared with us at a, at a temperature of about 400 degrees is when um, they have documentation that the pipe material is starting to smoke. So we kind of use that as our um, as our kind of baseline of that's when we're going to start seeing offgassing. That's when there's a potential for introducing um, gases and, 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 and vapors um, into the water supply. So, so looking at um, comparing the proposed 18-inch buried depth and the temperature of the soil that, that would be predicted, um, you know, we're seeing between, you know, a two and a half times safety factor when compared to the off-casting temperature to up to almost a three times safety factor um, when uh, looking at the, 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 the temperature when H2B pipe would be predicted to begin melting. So, so that's pretty reasonable safety factors um, based on industry standards. And so we felt comfortable moving forward with that 18 inch buried depth um, for, uh, for buried H2B pipe. So the final component that we looked at before developing the alternatives was um, looking at potential alignments. So, um, you know, one of the things that, that we talked about as a team with the district staff is that, you know, the, from a constructability perspective, you know, reconstructing um, the cross-country system within the existing alignment would be, um, you know, less challenging from a, um, a right-of-way and land ownership perspective. Um, the district owns all the land um, where where the, the pipe had previously existed, existed, so that was something that we wanted to, to make sure we carefully considered. But when thinking about the goal of providing a more resilient system, we also wanted to look at what um, uh, what opportunities there were to reduce the length of, of pipe that's within the watershed. And we'll, we're, we're in the next several slides after this, we'll start looking at some of the alternatives we developed. But when we start thinking about diverting and rerouting portions of the, um, in particular, the five mile segment, um, that results in some additional infrastructure that would be required. Um, either pump stations to be able to pump water so it normally flows by gravity to the line treatment plant. You would, you know, you would have to actually pump the water back to the line treatment plant. We also looked at, you know, opportunities of a potentially a second uh, water treatment plant. You know, instead of pumping raw water back to the to the line treatment plant, would would there be a benefit overall to the district to to construct a a, a new uh, treatment plant as a as a secondary uh, treatment plant, it's a redundant treatment plant um, for for at least um, treating uh, clear uh, water from uh, street water and clear creek. So with that, we'll look at the um, seven alternatives that the team developed and then we ultimately used for the evaluation. So. The first alternative here is the um, above ground HCPE. So this is basically reconstructing um, the cross country system um, similar to the um, to the previous system. So when we think about the different um, site conditions that we're going to encounter, um, both along the P line and and along the, the five mile, um, we're going to find a lot of different topography. There's going to be areas um, in the top left corner there where we're going to be able to build a bench to be able to inst install the pipe above ground, you know, with just some grading. But the the top right corner there is we are going to encounter some areas where, um, you know, it may not be feasible, even with smaller standard construction equipment, mini excavators, to be able to build um, a bench and, and be able to safely reconstruct even above grade pipe. So there is that potential for having retaining systems um, that would be required to facilitate construction. Um, but we also wanted to acknowledge that, you know, in the bottom left corner there, that we could potentially, um, you know, still even in some of the steeper topography, still safely build a bench that because we're because we're going to be just installing a pipe above grade, that it would be capable of dealing with some of those traverses. So thinking about where we can, you know, minimize the bench width. You know, don't you know? We don't necessarily want to you know make the bench width as wide as possible. Um, we want to make it the the right width to facilitate construction in, in a safe manner. Um, and then finally, thinking about uh, uh, creek crossings is um, you know there were most of the creek crossings uh, that existed were all above grade at varying elevations. But for for restoring the system and thinking about potential for debris flow um, or other other kind of just just you know nature uh, potentially damaging the pipe, we would. Um, elevate um, at, at those 17 or so creek crossings um, above above the um, the creek, so that we are you know protecting the pipe from from any damage from from water flow, debris, you know, any, anything that may that may come down the creek. So, so that was alternative one. 
Alternative two was same alignment, same concept, but what would it take to do it with um, a, above ground welded steel? So in this case, we would we believe we would be using primarily the top two details. Um, we would then need a much wider bench. Um, you know, as I mentioned a couple slides ago, you know, dealing with welded steel pipe, it's heavy. The the you know we're going to be able to move fewer pieces of pipe in at a time. Going to have to weld. It's going to it's going to be a really extensive and invasive process in order to um, in order to construct construct the project. We did you know still have on here you know where we could you know where the topography was just so challenging where we would try to minimize uh, the bench width, but you know that would be probably used on a very focused area. And then similar to alternative one, it would be above grade crossing the steel pipe steel support. So it's, so it's something that would be, uh, you know, a pretty, pretty robust construction system, um, really resilient to fires, but, you know, provide a lot of challenges on the structurability side. So alternative 3A um, is still within the same alignment, but now we're bearing the HTB pipe. Um, you see a little asterisk here. I'll, I'll explain that here in a second. Um, again, we still believe that there's going to be areas, even when we're bearing a pipe, where we're still going to um, need to create larger spaces, especially where, you know, in particular along P-Vine, where we already have, you know, wide roads, we're, we're going to, you know, take advantage of those. Um, where we are really challenged with topography, still introducing some retaining systems, but where, you know, the bottom left corner there, where we have some narrow benches, we also will look for opportunities, not necessarily to dig a trench and, and place the pipe, in a trench, but how can we use the grading that we're going to be doing for some of these uh, more narrow benches to place the pipe kind of on the next to the upslope and then and then use some of the material, the, the spoils from the grading operation and, and actually use that to cover the pipe. So again, trying to, to minimize disturbance within within the watershed, um, but still providing the inadequate level of protection um, to the pipe. Um, and, and you'll see here it calls out for a half a foot of, of um, cover. What in the concept that would be used in this narrow, shallow trench here is that you know over time materials would slough off the side and, and, and provide additional cover on the pipe. Finally, for 3A, we would still be using above ground uh, crossings, um, and in this case, we would transition to a welded steel. So um, again, above ground HTB pipe crossings, um, you know, get them high enough, you know, no damage from debris, but it's still that high risk uh, during a fire event that that the pipe could be damaged. So by by transitioning to a well steel pipe for the for the above ground creek crossing, um, we're providing that additional fire hardening um, as compared to HTP pipe. So the next alternative 3B, and we'll have to spend a lot of time with this, is essentially the same as alternative 3A, except in this case, we wanted to kind of consider if we buried all of the all of the uh, creek crossings in the bottom right um, uh, image there on the left hand side, um, where we would bury the creek crossings um, so that we would um, reduce that risk of uh, debris flow or, or damage um, at the creek crossing. Um, but the, the 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 risk here is it, it increases some of the permitting requirements potentially um, for for the construction activities. So um, the next several alternatives are looking at realignment. So we developed and thought about how we could um, potentially reduce the total length of, of pipeline within the watershed. And in looking at that, what we what we what we determined in, in, in working with district staff is the P-vine alignment, given its current conditions, the you know, reasonably wide benches, the you know, less debris that we found, you know, the kind of the easier you know, quote unquote, easier working environment. We didn't believe there was any benefit to trying to look at options for for rerunning P-vine alignment. So for for the next three alternatives, the P-vine alignment is um, remains the same. It'll be buried HTP pipe with uh, below grade creek crossing. But where we saw opportunity for potential realignment was to look at the Sweetwater and the Clear Creek intakes. Um, you know, when you when we got downstream of the Clear Creek intakes all the way to the Lion Treatment Plant, you know, there there are no more intakes. So there's 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 um, you know there's no disadvantage to rerouting the pipeline outside of outside of the watershed in terms of you know not um, picking up all the all the district intakes and maintaining the adequate uh, supply of raw water. Um, we wanted to evaluate the benefits and the risks associated with with rerouting, and so we first looked at 
independent pipelines for both the sweet water and the clear water intake. So those are showing here um, in the in the blue. Um, and we would uh, route these uh, to kind of the Brookdale area and then um, uh, join them in either one, probably two pump stations because we would have to then pump that raw water all the way back to a line treatment plant. So, so overall, the total length of pipe as a system is, is similar, but we've had a significant reduction in the amount of pipe that's within the watershed. So we're, we're providing additional um, a hardening of the system by removing it from the watershed and, and reducing some of the risks associated with um, some of the natural disasters, but increasing some other challenges and operational inspection, inspection um, uh, operational uh, costs as we introduce um, new pump stations and new facilities. So alternative 3B, again, just a small variation on alternative 3, 3 uh, 4A. Um, one of the challenges with you know separating the sweet water and the clear water is just the high potential for crossing land that's not owned by by the district. So we said let's just kind of look at a, a little bit of a hybrid alternative where we're still reducing the overall length within the watershed, so we're not taking uh, water from sweet water and the, and the clear water intakes all the way through the watershed to line, but rather follow the same alignment till we get. Um, uh, downstream the clear clear creek uh, in uh, intake number one there and then and then divert um, the alignment into into the into the Brookdale area um, single pump station but we still have that raw water uh, conveyance system to, to pump water back up to line the final alternative we had identified um, building off alternative 4b was instead of pumping raw water back to the line treatment plant what would be the potential benefits and risks of if we were to actually construct a second uh, water treatment facility um, somewhere, you know, along Highway 9, uh, at a location to be determined, but we wanted to kind of understand, um, you know, what would be the overall benefit of, a, of having a second treatment plant um, within the service area. So that was, um, that was really the, the, the last alternative that we looked at. Um, so we talked about uh, several slides ago, the, the success and the risk scores. And so once we developed each of the alternatives, we then um, gave those alternatives to each of the work groups, the four work groups, and each work group um, went off and independently evaluated each alternative for you know, its ability to meet each of the success criteria for, for the goal uh, of the, the work groups or the safety goal, the constructability goal, um, but also what the potential risks are. And so plotted here is kind of how the, each of the alternatives ranked and wanted to, to focus on, you know, the, 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 um, the higher the risk or the higher potential that there could be a risk for um, not achieving success, the higher the risk number. The, the, the alternative that would be able to provide the best opportunity for success, so the you know, meeting um, at a high level of the success criteria would have a higher success score here on the x-axis. So, so what we found is um, alternative 3B, you know, had resulted in the highest potential success score and also the lowest potential risk score. So we then looked at each of the alternatives. And so what I've, what I've shown here on this table is the individual success scores for each of the alternatives, as well as the individual risk scores. We also wanted to kind of circle back to, hey, are we still achieving the project goal of improving the overall um, reliability and resiliency through, through hardening of the system. And so what we found is, you know, most of the alternatives um, really do provide additional um, uh, hardening of the system. Um, so, you know, when you, you know, uh, alternative one, alternative two really did not fare very well in that, in, in, in those categories. But when we think about the, the kind of highest uh, scoring and lowest risk score alternative, alternative 3B, which is installing HDB pipe below grade, um, within a shallow trench and with the below grade creek crossings, that that kind of started to, to to show us that it that it met all of you know provided the highest opportunity for 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 delivering a project that meets each of the four goal statements that we established. So, when we start thinking about the alternative three B being the preferred alternative, we also wanted to think about the phasing. You know, Justin uh, talked about this a little bit about the goal of, of starting construction as soon as possible. And so one of the things that, that we talked about as a team with, with, uh, with Rick and, and his staff is, you know, Peavine is, a, uh, is, a, is its own project. It's something that we can focus on um, and really um, uh, start, start planning and, and developing a design. 
um, in, in our understanding is that that also provides a significant amount of additional water, raw water supply um, for, for treatment at the line treatment plant. So there's a lot of benefit to, to implementing um, the, the overall construction project actually in a phased approach. So instead of trying to build everything at once, how can we most effectively um, build a project? So the first, the first order of work that we're suggesting is the actual tree removal. So um, thinking about tree removal, um, planning that out is a really a distinct operation. It's a different construction operation than the pipeline construction. So it's something that can be you know, implemented um, first. And so um, under our proposal, um, the first you know, phase one would be P buying. We would first focus on uh, tree removal um, to, to you know, deal with any um, uh, you know, dead trees, uh, nesting birds, things like that, that could impact the overall construction. And then um, once we've completed the, the tree removal for, for phase one, we can begin uh, construction of the pea vine intake, uh, pea vine and um, uh, alignment. Um, while we're constructing pea vine, we can then turn our focus on the tree removal of uh, at least the first half of, um, of the five, five mile uh, segment. And we would recommend starting kind of at the top of the watershed and working our way uh, towards Lyon. Once we start, once we complete P vine, um, and we start, um, uh, we can start construction of the of the upper segment of the uh, five mile, and then and then as we're clearing trees for for the lower segment, and when we think about this process, we you know our team's best estimate is we could we could likely finish construction within three seasons, so in about three years from now, being able to have a fully restored uh, cross country system for the district. So the other component that we looked at um, is green potential for green en energy. So um, we looked at what we call micro hydro stations. So there are really two uh, primary options that we identified um, that would um, uh, could be benefited uh, used beneficially by the district. The first option one there on the left is an impulse turbine. This is kind of the standard you know wheel that you see at most uh, you know dams where you basically just have water running through a through a through a wheel that's spinning a turbine. Is generating electricity. Um, pretty common technology used. Um, some challenges with, with option one is it really requires a lot more infrastructure. Um, you know, you can see here in the image, there's control panels, it's building, it's you know, kind of bigger equipment. But we also explored a, a, another option, which is uh, in, called an inline PRV. It's, uh, this is a this is a product that's being used um, a lot in in um, uh, urban cities. Um, so installing them within existing distribution systems. And what it does is it actually uh, takes advantage of existing pressure reducing valves that that systems typically have when managing high pressure and low pressure zones. And so it's, it kind of hooks onto that PRV and, and takes um, the, the the purpose of the PRV is to you know basically reduce the pressure, physically you know cause turbulence in the in the water column to to reduce pressure. And so you can take and harness the the, the energy lost from the from the um, uh, from that from that process and actually. And turn it into into energy. So those are those are two options um, that that um, we'll we'll work with the district out to continue exploring. Um, the the potential generation, depending on you know influent flow, is basically the amount of electricity that can be generated is directly proportional to the amount of flow we're getting from the creek uh, from the diversions. And so we can generate for both options anywhere between ten to, to thirty kilowatts, um, uh, depending on the level of flow um, within within the creek. So. Um, the final slide I have tonight for us to talk about uh, is, um, you know, our, our team's initial um, opinion of probable project costs. So, you know, one of the one of the things that, you know, we recognize is is critical is the you know the the, the potential cost for reconstructing um, both the P line and the five mile. Um, we we understand that you know FEMA is going to be um, really focused on what what the potential costs are especially when you start looking at um you know implementing an alternative that might um, not be the exact same construction that the original system was but i think one of the things that that the technical team recognizes is you know there's a lot of you know constraints that we have in today's environment in terms of what can be constructed what can be permitted um, what what is a, you know what will a construction contractor be willing to do in terms of operation? And so um, when we start thinking about um, the potential range of costs, um, we really wanted to look at not only just the construction costs, which is the middle column there, um, but also what the what the all the supporting costs are, the the, the permitting uh, 
engineering costs, inspection costs, you know, everything that it takes to, to deliver a project. And so a couple things that we, we wanted to highlight is, you know, we are, you know, developed our cost estimates based on a phased approach, so multiple, multiple year construction. Um, you know, ultimately the conditions and accessing and getting equipment in and out of the watershed, you know, really, really does, um, you know, influence um, the, the overall potential production rates that, that our team estimates for, for constructing the project. Um, we did spend time, Aaron spent time talking to contractors, talking to suppliers, you know, not just, you know, thinking about, you know, on a, on a, at a desk of how we, this would be built, but really kind of getting some, some input from, from experts um, to really understand production rates so that we can really inform the, the range of costs here that, that we're showing on the screen. Um, um, but we've also, you know, thinking about some of the, the challenges of the site, you know, we talked about, um, you know, some of the, some of the topography is going to require retaining structures. Um, those have a large influence on, on the cost. So as we advance the next phase of the project, we start doing detailed topography of the alignment, detailed design, you know, the team will be focused on where are there opportunities to, to optimize the construction, um, to, to reduce the need if, if we can, I don't want to over promise, but reduce the need uh, where we can of, of using retaining structures um, because that, that will that will allow us to optimize some of these costs. Um, we've also tried to build in, um, you know, allowances for, you know, mitigating, you know, geotechnical hazards, things that we're going to come across as we're, as we're constructing the project. Um, and we'll, we'll plan for it as best we can, but recognizing that, um, you know, there's, there's going to be, you know, unknown conditions that, that we won't find. And so, you know, one of the advantages that we've talked about with the district staff about, you know, focusing on P-Vine first um, is, you know, obviously shown here, they're more affordable than two projects at this point, um, but we can focus on P-Vine, get that restored, you know, develop a design, engage a contractor, you know, see how things are going and that'll help us inform and, and optimize the five mile design. Not to say that we're going to do everything kind of sequential. We'll still be advancing the design of the five mile, but we want to make sure that we're, you know, taking advantage of, of once we get a contractor on site, you know, learning from from their their operations, learning, you know, they'll learn as they go, and and we'll, we'll probably find ways to optimize some of the construction along the five mile as well. So finally, um, next steps. Um, you know, we're we're completed our constructability study. We've got a draft study. We're working with Josh to finalize. Um, we're, we're recommending, as, as, as Justin said, that we begin advancing the CEQA and permitting um, along with design. But we also know, and, and we talked about this with Rick yesterday, is you know really important to engage in FEMA right away. Now that we've got kind of the study, we've got a you know an appending kind of board feedback. We we believe we have a preferred a preferred solution here. Um, we can we can really start those those discussions in collaboration with FEMA to be able to um, you know kind of get through the the funding process. So with that, um, I'm happy to answer any questions and Justin, Mark, and, and Aaron are, are here to help as well. So um, I will stop sharing my screen. I can always bring it back if there's any um, any slides that we want to look at. So um, thank you very much for the time. Sorry for the long presentation, but we just felt like we had a lot of information to, to share with the board and uh, hopefully nobody fell asleep during it. <laughs> No, that that was uh, very thankful. It, thank thank you, Jeff. It was very informative and entirely appropriate the link that you did. And so thank you um, to Justin, Mark, and Aaron as well. Um, Mark, would you like to begin by making a comment since you're you know the chair of the engineering committee? Yes, I would. Uh, to the to the team that put this together, uh, Jeff, thank you for this. Uh, it is informative. Um, I appreciate the fact that you took the comments that you received from the engineering committee, uh, in particular on the uh, pipe, uh, HDPE uh, performance criteria and how deep we would need to bury. And you went out to researchers and got additional information. Plus you put together the costs for us, uh, which we had not seen before. So thank you for making those changes and additions. Um, you're welcome. Uh, Secondly, um, I concur with uh, the uh, materials and the methods that um, this team is recommending. I've used um, sort of all three types of, of pipe um, on construction projects that I've managed. 
and I've used uh, both uh, open trench and uh, directional drilling methods. Um, and I agree with your assessment of here's how we should proceed with this. So given that, um, I do have questions though on potential timing of this. Mm -hmm. um, in particular, on the slide that you show the uh, CEQA compliance pathways, um, it's mm -hmm. page 11 of your presentation. Um, yeah. There were three uh, options on that. One was the um, emergency aspects. Yeah, let me get back to that, Mark. Bear with me. Okay, Hope so the, the rest of the folks can see that I'm focused right on that. Yes, this one. Oh, the emergency statutory exemption. Um, this would allow us to be in construction for the P-Vine section next summer. But uh, given the fact that we're dealing with FEMA on this um, and the five or six different agencies that you've listed on the earlier slide, um, what's the likelihood of this succeeding? Should we be giving any weight to this option um, or pretty much just rolling this out and we need to go to the uh, mitigated negative declaration aspects instead? Yeah, Mark, that's a, that's a great question. Actually, I'm going to go ahead and ask Justin to, to, to jump in here because this, okay. this is something that you know, we've been talking about, and um, I know he has some some thoughts on you know the the probability and the you know, kind of the, the applicability of the statutory mm -hmm. exemption for for the for the P vine segment. So, Justin, do you want to weigh in on this one, Chris? Sure. Yeah, definitely. It, those are very good points, Mark, and ones that we'll have to weigh when we're making the final decision in terms of what uh, compliance pathway to to go down for CEQA. Um, in terms of the, so the, the, the driver for, uh, behind the schedule numbers was primarily tree removal. Um, the approach to phasing the project um, is to do tree removal uh, outside of the breeding bird window mm -hmm. to avoid impact, right. potential impacts to birds. Uh, and so in order to, and then, so you have to do that in the fall. Uh, ahead of construction the following summer in order to avoid those impacts. And so to we have to uh, account for tree removal as part of any CEQA documentation if we uh, were to go through. The permits that I listed on the other slide, um, the majority of them are driven by aquatic resources impacts. Um, there are a few exceptions to that, uh, the, namely the Fish and Wildlife Service and Endangered Species Protection. Uh, we need to, in, and to uh, assess the potential for uh, that act. We, ha we have uh, you know, recommended that as part of the uh, jurisdictional assessment that surveys be conducted for a uh, marbled murrelet, which would be the bird that is potentially impacted. It's we're kind of on the margins of the range for that species. It's unlikely to be within these alignments, but it is still within, you know, we're operating on that margin. So there is still a potential for that species to be present. So um, that's one factor to weigh into that decision as well. Um, and, and in order to uh, be able to remove the trees this fall, we also have to have negative survey results for marbled mural at uh, nesting. So there are definitely a lot of factors involved in, in uh, making this decision in a, on top of the, the uh, you know, fact that the exemption doesn't require public review. Um, it's definitely feasible to get through these processes for tree removal in 2023 and uh, construction in summer 2024. Um, there are, even if we 
were to pursue the statutory exemption, you're right, though, there are still some risks that we don't make that schedule because of the, the things that I outlined. Okay. And um, is our contract with your team uh, in at this presentation, or, or do we have you involved through this process to at least help us uh, in the next several steps to get to? Uh, the decision points on which one of these uh, in environmental uh, regulatory pathways are we going to take, in particular with PVI. Uh, the other five mile segment, I have no hopes of the emergency statutory. Uh, at best, it's the mitigated declaration. I think it's probably going to be the environmental either impact yeah. report or statement. That that matches our our uh, assessment as well. Okay. Yeah. So, what do we have? How long do we have you engaged under your current contract to assist? Yeah, that's a great question, Mark. No, we we are engaged to kind of get to the spot of kind of choosing the CEQA path forward. Um, so that that's part of our existing agreement. Once that path forward, you know, the the next phase is actually completing the studies. Um, that Justin's talking about in the tree surveys that that would be part of a, a of a of a next agreement that we're we're already working with staff on to begin kind of outlining and, and so we we don't lose time um, there. But no, we our intent okay. is to help the district get to selection of the CEQA pathway and then we can you know move hopefully right into to actually implementing the CEQA. Okay, and I see um, later in this agenda the environmental department report. Uh, we do have the tree. Uh, a survey scheduled for spring 2022, so coming up mm -hmm. in the next several months. Um, yeah. And do I hear you saying, Justin, that if we uh, don't come up with uh, the 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 birds that are of impact, we could potentially go ahead with tree removals at that point. That's right. Yeah, we we need to okay. be careful about one other aspect of the the permits, and that's for uh, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Uh, mm -hmm. They also regulate riparian trees, and so as, as part of that, uh, part of the field work that that would be part of the the, the tree uh, surveys, it would include evaluating the areas around the creeks to determine if any of the trees that could be removed would be considered riparian species. A lot of the riparian zones were kind of taken out by the fire. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they're, so we may not encounter that situation, but we will be double checking that as we do those, those surveys. Okay. Well, uh, I'm glad to hear that you're on um, on board to help us through this and figure out the pathways through the regulatory aspects. Um, so good. Um, and we look forward to then to this, uh, the tree surveys and for the results from that. Um, I do have one other uh, more technical question. And uh, mm -hmm. Jeff, it's on the, um, the, the graph that you presented for the uh, minimum pipe depths with the temperatures mm -hmm. and the rest of that. Um, just so that I'm clear on that, um, I think that's page 17. No, I'm sorry. Yeah. It's yes, this, this one. This um, one yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, you're showing here the proposed 18-inch berry depth. Is that the total mm -hmm. depth of the trench so that the pipe is then... Um, because yeah. the slides you're showing us previously yep. are showing 18 inch. It, it, yeah, it, 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 yeah, it, yeah. What's the depth of the top it, of the pipe? Right. That's it, what I want to know. It, it, no, no, you're 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 correct, Mark. It, it would be depth of cover needs to be 18 inches to meet this. So our trench. Would need to be deeper, and and my the estimates and kind of work plans that I worked through included an 18 inch depth of cover, not an 18 inch depth of trench. Okay, your slides don't show that then on the evaluations. Yep. 
Yeah, we will. Yes, we will those, also go update that for the for the final for the right. final report, Mark. And I was hoping that those were correct, and I was misinterpreting this. Uh, a less digging, but okay, okay. Thank you. That's all the and, questions that I have. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Bob is the other member on the engineering committee. Would you like to comment or ask a question? I do have some questions. I wasn't on the committee at the time this was oh, okay. uh, being evaluated. But, so, um, but I do have questions. So okay. How about, how about, how about it? Can I just ask a question first? If then, oh, of course. Right. Um, the, the cost that you uh, showed us was uh, for the buried um, HDPE pipe. And obviously there's a bunch of, there's pretty uh, serious sticker shock, I think for many members of the board. Mm -hmm that this is a lot more than we had anticipated. Um, and so one question I have is, how does that number change if we have HDPE that is not buried? Um, because mm -hmm. one of the questions we'll have to face as a board is deciding which way to go. And part of that is dependent on what FEMA is willing to um, reimburse us for. So in other words, they, they will reimburse what we had there, which was above ground, but if they're not willing to reimburse some cost, some part of the cost of, uh, you know, bearing it, we, we may have a hard, hard decision to make. So one part of my question is the difference in the costs. And then the, the second part of my question is, is how does um, making a decision to bury it versus have it above ground affect the kinds of uh, CEQA pathways that we've talked about? Does it make any difference? Great, yeah, no, that, um, thank you uh, for, the, for those questions. So I think we'll take the first one and, and I'll, I'll start and Aaron's gonna jump in. Um, so one of the ways that um, Aaron developed the cost estimate, we, we, we really looked at what that incremental cost is for, for installing the pipe. So we have that number that we can we can, can share. Um, it's, it's not a significant number. Um, you know, when we think about the, a lot of the costs associated with, with the construction, um, the retaining structures and, and access, those are those are a large driver. So, I mean, Aaron, do you want to talk a little bit about um, kind of the, the I'll call it the premium for bearing the pipe that that we that you developed. Yeah, uh, no, I this this did come up in the, the engineering committee meeting, and so I had you know kind of specifically broke that cost out to try and analyze it. Um, and as I think everybody could understand, it's going to vary based on the, the the trench type that we're using. I mean, it's more costly to dig and bury it in the, the narrow trenches, in the areas where we have a lot more additional working restrictions, maybe retaining walls. So there's 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 definitely a range of what I would call premium cost. Um, and I would say that range is somewhere between 60 and $100 per linear foot of direct cost. Now that does not include markup and contingency. So given the total footage of the alignment, that's somewhere in the you know in the million and a half to, to three to four million dollars, um, not including if we're going to put risk contingency escalation on top of those numbers. So it does increase the cost, um, but you know I think as to Jeff's point, you know given the size of the project, um, it's it, I shouldn't say it's insignificant, but there's not massive savings. Um, and the, uh, the other thing that I think should be considered is if we put the pipe above ground, it's probably going to still require some type of anchoring system. There's, you know, I know they had staked it to the ground. I mean, maybe that would be acceptable. Probably not best practices. It would probably you know, necessitate, you know, some better type of a support or anchoring system. So there would be some cost to, to leave it on top of the ground. I mean, especially if if the pipe selection changed to steel, because steel can't rest on the ground for corrosion purposes. So it would have to be elevated on some type of pipe support, you know, probably a concrete support if we went with steel. Um, so I don't know if that fully answers your question. I mean, well, that, obviously that, that helps. Yeah. Yeah. And and I think just kind of as, as Aaron mentioned, you know, kind of best practices, what are current requirements? I think that's the other thing that, you know, um, Rick, Josh, and I talked about a little bit yesterday was, hey, you know, at some point, 
there's only the regulations, current regulations are only going to allow us to do certain things. And so really, you know, when we look, think about best practices is, you know, is it even regulatory, you know, uh, allowable to, to put pipe above ground? So those are things we're still exploring in anticipation of these questions from, from FEMA. You know, this is Mark. Another thing too, even contractor efficiency, you know, if it's on the bench, mm -hmm. it's in their way. You know, if they, mm -hmm. if they can bury it, then, you know, they can get access over the top of it much easier. So, I mean, um, it, it may actually, you know, a lot of it go away just because of their efficiency on what they, however they decide to work. Yeah, yeah, that's right, Mark. Thank you. And so, um, Justin, if maybe you could help answer the second part of that question about um, impacts to the, to, to the, you know, kind of CEQA pathways that we talked about of, you know, buried versus above ground. Sure. Yeah, the, that uh, decision wouldn't affect the CEQA compliance pathway uh, decision. Uh, it, there, you know, there could be some differences in some of the analysis that, that might be done as part of the uh, initial study uh, mitigated negative declaration and the EIR, but it wouldn't affect the decision on which of those pathways to take. Okay, thank you. That, that was all. Go ahead, Bob. Well, geez, Gail, you, you took my first question. <laughs> <laughs> See, sometimes you know, we think alike, Bob. <laughs> well, I, more, more, than, more than sometimes, right? Um, so, uh, the, um, yeah, so I have to recover here a little bit. So the next question I wanted to ask about was um, hybrid. So I like to think out of the box. So, you know, we've been talking about either all HDPE or uh all welded steel what have you well what if in certain areas we put welded steel on top of the ground and in other areas we put hdp underground is, is that a possibility as well if it if it made it easier to do certain construction in certain areas i i don't know bob the short answer is yes i mean i think there's still you know by selecting a preferred alternative at this stage doesn't you know, from a from a the, the technical team's perspective, doesn't mean that's it. That's all we're doing. What it allows us to do is it really allowed us to try and kind of quantify kind of potential costs and strategies. Um, and then as we get into the next phase of the detailed design, the topographic survey, we're going to take a hard look at what is the kind of the right solution. If there's opportunities to to use welded steel, if that's going to you know minimize impact, or there's you know cost saving options, whatever it may be. That's something that we're going to evaluate. We actually talked about this uh, during the engineering committee meeting about, you know, you know, widely using trenchless technology doesn't make sense. It doesn't seem to, but that doesn't mean that it shouldn't be part of our our toolbox when we get into the detailed design. That might, you know, we may find as we do detailed design that hey, there's there's a there's a spot where trenchless would really, you know, benefit us in avoiding potential impacts from a from a you know kind of aquatic resources perspective, and so maybe worse the investment. So I think. Uh, the kind of the short answer is yes. We, I think I think everything's still on the table. It's just trying to focus us on what the kind of the right alignment and majority of the of the of the installation is is was the purpose of kind of not kind of refining a, a yet another alternative. Is that I don't know? Did I answer your question? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, uh, you may have talked about this in the committee, and maybe I didn't hear it here, but did we also consider earthquake resilience since we actually could get an earthquake maybe yeah. before a fire? Yeah, and yeah, and that was um, in, in the constructability study, we, we provide some kind of detailed tables. Um, welded steel would not perform well as, as well as HDPE in an earthquake. So that was something that we looked at from an operations perspective and in those success and risk criteria, that was something that we did look at as we have the, the anticipated performance um, with a um, with, with the individual pipe material. So HDPE being a much more flexible material would be expected to perform better. One of the things that we will look at as we get into um, detailed design, if we're finding geohazards landslide areas that you know may be you know triggered during a seismic event, if there's you know localized improvements such as they have something that's called an EBA flex pen, which is this basically this piece of pipe that has two balls on each side and it kind of moves yeah. and moves around. You know, if we want to use that to improve additional seismic resiliency, we will. But overall, you know, it's it's 
the technical team's opinion that you know the HDB pipe is going to be a, a better performing pipe, in, in, you know, following a major seismic event as compared to welded steel. Okay. And uh, when you're working on the cost, did you come up with relative costs for all the different uh, options that that you evaluate? Uh, or just no, one, or just not. Uh, no. Just the one. Just the one. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I thought I had heard in, in the wake of the Paradise Fire that their system got contaminated with um, outgassing even at a three-foot depth. Uh, did, did we, did I hear that wrong or is that just urban legend? I think Rick needs to answer that. I can, I mean, I can answer okay. that one. We talked with Paradise in depth. Yeah. You're yeah. correct, Bob. Their berry pipes, three foot depth, did have contamination, but it was from steam entering into the distribution system. It wasn't okay. from fire reaching down to the depth of the pipe. It was above ground boiling, and then steam went back up into the system and melted and released those VOCs. Okay, great. Um, you know, one of the things that I, I wanted to uh, dive into a little bit more, again, thinking out of the box, is um, what percentage of water we're getting from each of our surface um, uh, sources. And, and that's a, you know, percentage of water average year. Um, and whether or not um, the ROI on a particular water source is um, significant. significant. So, you know, I, I, hate, I hate the concept of not doing um, uh, pre-1914 water sources, but this five-mile pipeline is, is an enormous lift, as, as Gail was pointing out. There, there's a lot of sticker shock. I mean, I was anticipating it was going to be big. Um, and, you know, in the order of 40 million, but hey, we're, we're talking about a significant number over that. Um, ha have we looked at, have we analyzed that? And have we, um, ha have we looked at whether or not that percentage might change given the, regula the regulatory world we're in right now, which doesn't always deliver better results, just more regulation? Um, relative to construction, what we can put in, that sort of thing. FNL wasn't tasked um, with that exercise. You know, we can look at those numbers, but, you know, we do know that our surface water is about 50%. Yeah, you know, I know that. What we would be doing is most likely we would be transferring over to the wells and we don't have a number today of what uh, Santa Margarita Groundwater Agency well water extraction is going to cost. I think we'd be shifting the cost uh, and the water quality as well. I mean, we could look at that, but it, they're unique numbers because certain times of the year when there's adequate rainfall like there is right now, we shut down uh, sources. Uh, Peavine, uh, Sweetwater, Clear Creek would be shut down. We would have to look at the summer months and you look at that amount of water and it's a valuable amount of water. And, and you know, we're looking to shift more towards conjunctive use to lower our, our uh, extraction from our, our groundwater wells. Well, uh, let me, we let me give you an example. Number, but we let have me give you, okay, let, let me give you an example. I, I think Sweetwater delivers, relatively speaking, less than Clear Creek or Foreman Creek. Um, and so would we be able to take more out of Clear Creek or Foreman Creek to make up for if we didn't do Sweetwater? Not in the summer um, months. Not, not in the summer months. In the summer months, we're taking all water that we can take. Um, there isn't you know, more water in Clear Creek or more water in Foreman in the summer months. The summer months are all reduced down to minimal flows and we take from all those sources. And there's not more water. <laughs> you know, Fall Creek is a is a stream that puts more water, but we have uh, very stringent uh, fishing game bypass requirements. Uh, yes, and and certainly I think what factors into this is also what happens with um, our water rights, where we can send water from any source to any destination. I mean, that's definitely what we're working on uh, right. to get to. Um, and that would be predominantly winter flows, though, Bob. That won't be summer uh, flows. It would be winter uh, flows because the water's not there in the summer. I understand. I, I think it would be worthwhile. I, I'm assuming we have some of these 
uh, numbers of what we pull out of each creek uh, in, in, historically. And it might be something I could come in the office and kind of go through the files and pick that up. I'm curious, I, I really am curious as to uh, what, what those numbers are. Well, if you, um, if you look in the, uh, the director of operations production reports, those numbers are, are by the month and have been for many years in the report to the board. Yeah, I, I was hoping they might actually be in a file somewhere a little easier to pull up, but we could do that. Mark, um, do you want to pop in there? It looks like you have something to add. Um, I, I do concur with Bob's thought of should we be putting all of these surface water intakes back in um, because I'm, as, as he was asking the question, thinking the same thing, are we spending a lot of money for a minimal percentage of our water at one of these sites? So I think having that uh, sort of summary information for each of these intakes would be important to help inform, do we put all of these back in? Do we go after or to the question that Bob's asking, do we, uh, for some period of time, not put all of these back in? We can we can definitely uh, get you that information. Um, you know, keep in mind putting them all back in as they were is, is will be covered by FEMA. Uh, and also keep in mind, if we don't take that water from surface sources, it will come from groundwater. And grant you, our customers are doing a great job on conservation and our water use is low, but we don't mm -hmm. have a good idea of what the cost of groundwater is going to be three to five years down the road, but we do know it's going to be astronomical in the Santa Margarita groundwater. So, well, so, I and mean, I, 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 I think also, I think also, um, Rick, another uh, consideration I'd like to throw in here, and it's still early on, but does the possible big basin consolidation uh, have any impact on our uh, determination in this, given they do have a surface water source? I don't know exactly how far it is from uh, the treatment plant or what the terrain is, is like exactly, um, but that, that is another potential uh, source. And and we're looking to bring the big basin source on. We don't we don't have the water to serve big basin without a source. I would not recommend taking big basin on without a water source. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So um, and, and what is and so I guess the other question would be: Is there any water out of uh, that source that is, would be considered surplus beyond just serving the current big basin? Uh, water customers, as is the case with Fall Creek, for example, where there is yeah. water that can supply more. And the, you know, the, the the short answer is yes. During winter flows and conjunctive mm -hmm. use, but when we hit the summertime, especially in times of drought, there is no excess surplus water, and that's why we're well, looking I, at uh, we're looking at uh, Loch Lomond water to pick yeah, up. Yeah, I I, I I get that, and that's my next question about you know factoring in the, the Loch Lomond water. Um, and where the money would be best spent to get the biggest bang on the buck for sure. the, the water source that, that you're looking at. I mean, in a lot of the um, summer months and drought months, our surface water effectively goes away anyway, uh, right? Or it goes down to such a minor percentage that it's, uh, you know, it, it, no, it, you're no. going mostly well anyway. No, we, and, and you keep in mind, it, you know, our, our, all of the surface water that you're getting from, these sources are all gravity. Once you start moving over to groundwater, not only do you have the groundwater extraction, but you have power and operational costs that we're trying to reduce. I mean, I think I think the exercise would be good to get this information to the engineering committee of our, our water sources. Uh, that's an easy exercise that we can put together, but there's a lot of, I guess, for lack of a better term, aspirants that have to go by because those sources, you know, in the wintertime are not all in. That's not mm -hmm. only the water, you know, it's, it's, it's Mar uh, March, April, you know, through uh, November is when we drastically count. And look, it fits surface water is about 50%. And we're trying to increase that because it's a cheaper water. Much yeah. cheaper and water than ground. And I, 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 I would understand. Like to, I, have, um, I have one other, um, I have one other question. And I, well, I'd like to like bring, let, let's let some other people in on this. And I think. Can I, I, think fin can I finish my one question? One question. 
Um, well, I, I really would like to go and give some other people a chance. I think that Rick got your point about this, and he can take it back to the engineering. Yeah. And I will come. I will come back the, to you. But the, let's just get the, other people in. Jamie. The, yeah. The, Jamie. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Gail. Um, I, I'm fine to let Bob finish his one question. I just my question is relevant to this this discussion that Rick and Bob are having, which is why I raised my hand because. I think that it's it's important if we're going to look at um, <clears throat> the amount of water that we're likely to get from any intake, um, we need to also understand well, what is the actual cost to us? What are, what are we saving um, if we were to foreclose our opportunity to have that intake in the future? Um, because, you know, obviously if it's a, if it's, you know, a, de minimis in terms of the actual savings and we're foreclosing uh, uh, another raw surface water intake, I, I, you know, even if it's a small amount, I'm not sure that, you know, that's a wise thing to do. So I, I just think that if we're going to investigate the one number, we also need to understand what we're savings, what the savings are in terms of the capital project. Lois, um, you, uh, Lois, did you have anything that you, questions that you want to ask? So, uh, so more involved that I hardly know what to ask. It's, it just got woo, going off here, going off there. And I had been on the engineering committee when this was first talked about and, and what they presented tonight, it had some new stuff, but with all the questions, I, I don't know where to begin. Well, um, okay. Um, Bob, you want to um, go back to you now? Yeah, my last question had to do with rerouting of the pipe. So, for example, if we pumped the water up to a higher elevation, would there be an easier, less costly path to get down to the Lion treatment plant? Um, I... I don't have an answer for you, Director Fultz. We did not look at that. Um, I don't know, Rick or Josh. I don't, I don't think, you, you know, it's, it's, it's the distance yeah. is the distance. You know, if, and if you pumped it up higher, you'd probably be starting to get off district property, and then you would have to, you know, we already have to break down the pressure or reduce pressure from the treatment plant because the water comes sure. in. Moving those, and you would look at, you know, reconstructing, pipe trail. We already have a trail on basically a 1% grade across the Empire grade mm -hmm. mountain uh, to bring that water 100% gravity uh, to the, the uh, Lion water treatment plant. Um, if you moved it, I think you'd be looking at much more increased cost on trying to find uh, a location than cut new trail. Uh, you could go higher, but I don't think you'd shorten it, Bob. Okay. And the higher you go in the watershed, you know, there's no power at the intakes. So the higher you go in the watershed, the right. less water there is. And then you're talking at a big regulatory uh, permitting process to change the point of intake um, where we extract. Oh, yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't talking about changing the point of intake, but perhaps where the intake goes. And um, I do agree with Jamie on that. Part of the ROI calculation is looking at both um, – the savings and the costs and the trade-offs between those two. Um, but I think in order for us to make sure that we are, be, because of the costs that are involved here and because it's likely, well, I'm, I'm anticipating FEMA may say, no, we're not paying to go underground. You get to pay for that. Um, we'll come up with a percentage and it depends. You know, that's our next step after, you know, hopefully uh, the board will, you know, give us some type of indication tonight of, of what uh, scenario uh, they take the recommendation of FNL. And then our next step is to sit down uh, with our, our CEQA team, which includes our CEQA legal, legal team to talk about permitting, because there's a few other issues um, that we're, we're permitting intakes and so forth. Uh, and we'll want to uh, bring the CEQA legal team in, and then we will also simultaneously talk to FEMA and see what uh, they will pay to harden uh, the pipeline. Now we just start getting into the percentages, and a big question will be, 
how much the difference is putting it back like it was uh, and then burying the pipeline. And then we look at current codes and standards and see if we can come up with some type of current code and standard that says that pipeline should be buried and then that changed the percentages. Sure, of course. This, this could last six, eight months to get through FEMA on this. I'm not gonna call it a, an alternative project on a, on a hardening of the project because part of what FEMA's money and FEMA's uh, program is, is that they want you to put this back in protecting it from future fires. They pay for it once and they say, hey, we'll help pay for um, hardening so this doesn't happen again. But now we got to find out what that percentage is. Um, and then, you know, we'll, they'll take uh, FNL's numbers to look and they'll come up with a number of what we can all agree on what it would take to replace. And then we'll look at what the difference is. Um, and then the district would have to make some decisions what that percentage and how much the district is, is willing to spend. Uh, or we fight with FEMA to get more. There's, there's a process here that's going to take a while um, to get this through. Yeah, I understand. We, we went through it before. It, it, I know. We've done it before where they've actually given us a lot of upgrades because of standards yes, and practices, exactly. like the two-inch uh, above ground suspended from the tree water pipe over a creek. Right. Yeah, um, there have been multiples of those. Yeah. Gail, I, I may be misunderstanding the agenda item. I, I, it says no action recommended. Yeah, I, 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 I agree. I, I was a little surprised by what Rick has said either. Well, that's, I, yeah. I, so hey, Mayor. I thought that we're, we're, we are not making a recommendation tonight. And certainly um, I, I thought that what I heard was that some of these things are going to go back to the engineering committee. That's what I thought too. And I, I mean, I think that, well, let's put it this way. I, I don't think anybody's jumping up and down and saying we should put plastic pipe above ground, right? I mean, I think no, no. everybody <laughs> agrees with the general assessment that HDPE below ground is the logical thing. And maybe some of the uh, river, the creek crossings should be steel above ground. I, I'm agnostic about that, but I, I think that seems like a fair thing that you you've convinced us all of that if that's what you need rick and 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 i'm maybe i, I misstated because i am looking to take this back i'm not looking for a, a formal board act i'm trying to get a feel from the board so when we go back to the engineering committee we can drill down there's no sense drilling down on on putting in additional water treatment plants if that's not what we're hearing from the board tonight i'm not looking for action from the board but if i heard you all say that, hey, that's great. Let's put in two more treatment plants. You know, we would spend more time. I don't want to spend FNL's time or the engineering committee on on an, uh, a scenario that the district really has no interest in doing. And that's kind of my point for tonight, is to to get, kind of get an idea of the feel of the board. Okay, Mark. Um, <clears throat> is it time for Rick to begin to have the discussion with FEMA? He asked that question then. I believe it is. Okay. I, I'm I'm comfortable with that. Given these um, preliminary cost uh, numbers that we have from FNL, for you to begin to have the discussion with FEMA, uh, with here's the likely preferred alternative. It's most most of the pipe being buried HDPE. There's probable costs. And start to get a feel from FEMA uh, what questions they're going to have about us doing this work. I'm not expecting an answer from them anytime soon. Right. Any I agree with that. We'll also get some indication from FEMA. FEMA has their own internal uh, environmental, and we may mm -hmm. not have a choice of what they want to see for environmental. I mean, we have some great choices. We have some great discussion tonight. The FEMA environmental team may say, hey, this project, because of the scope of this project, this is what you're going to do. And they'll pay for it, you know. Right. So um, we'll have to uh, include them in. You know, we've had some great environmental yes. discussion, and uh, the environmental team that FNL has, has has met with our our council, yes. and we've talked, and, and we've, you know, there, it's been a great exercise. But we now just have to go to the next step. Okay. So I'll ask one more question to the board with Jamie, but then after that, I'm going to go out to the public. 
Sure, thanks. And actually, that's a, a this will be a good transition um, because I was just going to acknowledge that in the timeline for having the conversations with FEMA, one of the things that came up today in the conversation, um, uh, Chair Mahood, that we had with um, Congressman Panetta was that they are seeing some really unusual delays in the bureaucracy um, in terms of just processing, uh, you know, any kind of, um, you know, project through the the administrative process right now and they it's because of covid and and delays that they're seeing in the administrative process throughout the agency but we should really anticipate i would say you know very significant delays um on that front and so um i just you know want us all to be mindful of that and and you know and patient as we go forward in this process and um chair if you'd like to take public comment that would be great yeah Okay, um, let's go out. Are there any um, comments? Um, April. Okay. So I think you can hear me now. Yes, we can. Great. I'm just um, considering the buried HDPE in the diagram of the narrow bench where there was an idea of putting some fill across it, but I believe that it was only about six or eight inches of fill, which makes me not so comfortable given that 18 inches is much safer in case of a fire. So that makes me wonder, and maybe you have a rough idea and maybe you don't, how, what percentage of the pipeline would end up being in a narrow bench shallow fill situation like how much risk are we exposing that pipe to along its length thanks Jeff you want to take that Go ahead, Jeff. yeah absolutely so um we we do not have um a a distribution of how how often we'll be using each one of those details the purpose of those details was really to kind of provide us with a with a menu of options um, so we'll be, you know, during the design phase, we would be really looking carefully at, you know, where we were using that. The, the idea of that narrow bench was um, a, a, an opportunity to reduce potential um, disturbance of the watershed. Um, but to your question about the um, the fill, yeah, no, we it, the idea with that narrow bench, placing the pipe and then placing a, a small amount of fill over it is in that narrow bench, we would expect, you know, reasonably soon after, some sloughing to happen, so we basically get some additional soil from the from the uphill slope to slough down. It wouldn't be used in an area where we would be concerned about, you know, unstable slopes and like that, but where we can take a benefit of reducing the amount of earthwork being moved um, to take advantage of if we kind of cut in that bench and then allow kind of natural soil movement in, in a minor case to provide that additional, you know, 12 to, to, to 14 inches of cover on it. So we would be very careful in selecting that option. Um, because because I, I concur with you, we don't want we don't want to you know be providing just six inches of cover. We want to provide something that's closer to the, the 18 inches 18 inches of cover where we find that we're going to provide you know a reasonable uh, safety factor to protect the pipe. So I think that answered the question. Hopefully. Any other questions from the public? Uh, Rick Moran. Rick, did I see your hand go up? And then it went down. One more, one more chance with the public. Anybody want to ask a question? Okay, Rick, you definitely want to talk to us this time, okay? <laughs> and um, I hope they emphasize that, all right? There's a lot of different terrains up there and they can adjust to uh, above ground, below ground, the terrain uh, call, can call for it. Um, so I, I'd, I'd like them to uh, focus in on that. The uh, the other thing I'd like to say is, I know we yeah, I haven't talked much about this uh, hydro energy station, but I know that uh, in the water district, they've talked about it before, particularly up on Bennett and Bull uh, at the Fall Creek tributaries and never really took off, but I would love to see this uh, be part of the project. And I just wonder how, you know, so it's about a million dollars. I was wondering how much, how long would it take for us to save a million dollars in electricity or 
when do you think we'd get our return on investment to use Bob's term? All right, thank you very much. Jeff, if you want to respond. Yet, but that is something that will be coming as we move ahead. Okay, so that, yeah, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, and I, I didn't catch the first part of Rick's comment, but it sounded like just being aware of, of the topography as you get into the design, looking for opportunities to use a combination of above ground and below ground. Yeah, yeah Sammy, that I agree. We will we will do that. And did you want to comment on um, the hydroelectric? I guess what I I was really struck by is that um, it's pretty small, ten to thirty kilowatts. I mean, that's what it takes to power yeah. our house. And if it's going to cost us a mm -hmm. million dollars, uh, I kind of think, well, thank you very much, but no. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, and, unless it's, mm -hmm. it's putting electricity in a place that we otherwise don't have it and we need it, but that um, that doesn't seem like a very good investment. Yeah, yeah, Director Mahood, you're, you're, you're correct. Yeah, the, the ROI on it is not. Not great. Uh, we'll just leave it at that. It's it is it's you know the the facilities, um, in particular with the impulse turbine, are just you know expensive. There's a lot of infrastructure that goes into making those those hydro stations work well. Um, I think I think we could you know look a little bit closer at the inline PRD solution. There might be other ways to optimize it, but again, it's it's not. There's not a lot of potential there. It's, um, it's, it's not jumping out at me as a great. Thing to do. Okay. Yeah. Uh, any other comments by board members? Uh, Bob. Yeah, my my dad worked in the, all the dams on the Columbia, most of the dams in the Columbia, and he always said scale is everything when it comes to yeah. the ROI and yeah. hydro. And you know, yeah, uh, you, we we can certainly run the numbers. It'd probably take you fifteen minutes to do a quick spreadsheet, and you'll see the the ROI. You're you're being very kind, Gail. I, <laughs> the ROI isn't, isn't going to be there, I don't think. Um, I did also want to raise the topic of financing, um, and that is how we're going to finance the balance. So, you know, one of the reasons I pushed for $15 million, uh, for the uh, project is I had this sneaking suspicion that these costs were going to escalate pretty rapidly. Um, I think we've actually gone beyond that, depending on how much FEMA will, will pay for um, and so we also we're going to have to talk about financing uh, on this, and and whether or not it might be better to look at P vine coming into the 15 million, but the five mile going into a separate uh, financing type of arrangement, whether that's a um, uh, bond, special assessment, loan, what have you. I mean, but I think it's worthwhile uh, discussing that at the finance committee uh, level at some point. Um, I, I also wanted to say very, very strongly, though, in, in, the, in giving Rick guidance from my personal perspective, um, I think one of the first things I said in the wake of the fire is that we will not rebuild, at least I didn't want to rebuild what we had before because it was not resilient to uh, fire. And we certainly still have fire dan danger up there. So um, above ground HDPE, from my point of view, is a non-starter. Um, above ground uh, welded steel, I can get with that, but not above ground HDPE, period. Okay. Um, Rick, do you? Um, oh, go ahead, Mark. Well, one last uh, comment. Since we're already um, pretty much rolling out this uh, the electrical generation aspects and the potential of that. Uh, for now, Rick, I would recommend, don't even bring that up with FEMA. Well, the, the hydro part of this is not FEMA, not Agreed. FEMA. Yeah. Um, but I, I don't want to rule out hydro yet till we take the full look, just like kind of everything else, because there is carbon footprint. There is other, you know, there is other aspects to creating you know, and of course, we don't want to spend a uh, an enormous sum of money for very little payback. But we need to look at this uh, from start to stop and get some good numbers. You know, we're at rough engineering costs now, um, and, and take a, a good look at it. Um, 
you know, this is the time to look at it when we're replacing the pipeline. Um, and, and let's take a full look at it, just like you want to do with, uh, with the intakes and, and the amount of water that we get in. I, I, I agree keeping it in, in our evaluation at this point, but don't confuse FEMA. Don't no, give FEMA, them something FEMA to shoot out. Yeah, this is non-FEMA yeah. non eligible. Um, yes. and it would come late in the project, so we had time to budget if we were so to move ahead. And there Agreed. is still a lot of uh, engineering to be done with, yes. this, uh, with this. Okay, thanks. Yeah, that's, that's a good point that it is not FEMA eligible. And right. you know, to Bob's point and, and the financing and the costs, you know, we need to, to get through this exercise with FEMA, find out exactly what the district's costs are. You know, realistically, they should be minimal, um, even with, uh, and I know minimal on 20 or 30, 30 million could still be a lot of money. There's no doubt about that. But um, we need to lock down FEMA on numbers and that may take two or three appeals. You know, this is, FEMA is not an easy process. Their first answer is no. And then, you know, you keep fighting the process until you get the answer you want. And it, it's going to take a while. But at the same time, hopefully we can move ahead on environmental. Um, we do have permitting to do uh, with fish and game on the intake structures that are gonna come up as part of this process. Um, so there's, there's a lot of work to do here. Um, you know, I'm glad we got Foreman Creek back in because we are relying on the wells more. And there's no doubt about it. And we are taking more surface water, yes, out of Felton, but right now um, we are not in compliance. We're working on an emergency temporary um, uh, uh, allowance to take uh, more water. We're staying in the fisheries requirement. We're not uh, violating fishery bypasses. Um, but, you know, we're shifting around where we're getting our water and we're more reliant and you will see the increase uh, in the uh, Lampico and the Santa Margarita uh, aquifers this year because of CZU fire. So, um, you know, uh, we'll get this information together back to engineering, uh, production data from the different sources. Uh, we'll open up dialogue now with FEMA on uh, we're leaning towards, you know, talking to FEMA about an HDPE line underground. Uh, no decisions have been made, but we need to start the conversation. And we'll bring this back to the engineering department. I think that's what I've heard tonight. Yeah. And I guess one thing I would just add from my own standpoint is I, I would uh, disagree with Director Fultz about the um, welded steel. And this is just as a geologist speaking that um, I think that the hazards that that pre uh, presents in terms of landslide hazards and um, earthquakes. Um, I mean, I, I know we're focused on fire because that's, you know, most present in our mind, but we also have these other issues. And of course, that whole mountain is just one landslide after another on the east side of Ben Lomond Mountain. So, and the environmental impacts of putting in that is greater and it's also harder to fix. So my own personal take is I, I, I personally much favor the underground HDPE and I, I hope that that's what we focus on. And keep in mind, HDPE pipe is a great product for this type of application, but yes, it needs to be buried. You know, earthquakes, mm -hmm. we've been through earthquakes, we've been through landslides. It's a very resilient pipe, especially because the joints are welded. You know, there's no fittings for it to pull out. And when you go to steel pipe or with, uh, with pipes with valves and, and fittings, they have gaskets. And that's where you get your VOCs from the melting uh, rubber gaskets and, and the plastics. Um, and once, you know, and, uh, you know, there's some great points made tonight about, you know, use uh, steel in some locations, you know, above ground river crossings and use HDPE and others. One of the real problems is you have to be careful of it. if the VOCs release into the water, into the pipe, it travels through the pipe, most likely we won't be able to get those VOCs out of the pipe. So uh, contamination is uh, a concern going down the road, but that's all that we'll, we'll work on. Um, from my perspective, I really, really want to thank uh, FNL, Jeff and his team. They, they assembled a very professional team of uh, engineers 
and a lot of great discussion went back and forth with the director of operations, the district engineer, Harley, our environmental planner, um, the engineering committee. Uh, it was a group effort. We have a lot of experience in operating um, that pipeline, and, and we installed that pipeline back in the day. But uh, their team was great, and we, we appreciated working with them up to this time and look forward to continuing. Bob, looks like you want a final word. Well, I, I want to make sure that um, I'm clarifying things because okay. I still don't know that we're disagreeing. <laughs> <laughs> so my, my point was is that if we had to go above ground and there was no other oh, way oh, to okay. do it at particular oh. places, then we Got would it. use steam, right? right? But yes, otherwise, you're absolutely correct. We want to go underground as much as we possibly can. Okay. okay. Um, so we are in agreement then. Okay. Yes, Great. exactly. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Again, I want to thank you, Jeff, and your team for a good presentation and a great discussion tonight. And I hope, um, it, it, as Lois says, it was a lot. Um, and I hope that the public also gained a lot from listening to this. Um, and it's the beginning of what I'm sure engineering will be bringing back more for us to discuss in the future. So yes. with that, I will let you guys go home. Um, okay. Thank you very much for coming tonight, and we will continue on with our unfinished business, the first of which is the thing tonight that allows us to continue to operate uh, remotely, and so we have uh, a motion um, to ratify and readopt the... Second. <laughs> 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 well, do you do you think you're on a game show there, Jamie? I mean, yeah, Jeopardy, or whatever. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Boom. We've done this enough now, right? We know what this is. <laughs> but the seven attendees may know. All right. Uh, we have to ratify and readopt the attached resolution number twenty one twenty two, so that we can continue in effect uh, for another thirty days to meet remotely. So there's the motion. Do I have somebody that would move the motion? I'll move it. Move. Second. 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 Thank you, Bob, for the second. Um, can we have a, a roll call vote, Holly? Here, Mayhood. Yeah. Uh, could you uh, take? Public comment, if there is any. Our, oh, my goodness. Okay. Public comment. All right. I don't see any. I, Good job, I mean, guys. Good. I guess they all want to stay home in their PJs, too, and come to the meeting. In their PJs with a glass of wine. It's much more fun. All right. Can we now? Uh, I don't see any, any comments from the public. So, Holly, can we now have a uh, roll call vote? President Mayhood. Yes. Vice President Henry. Yes. Director Ackman. Yes. Director Falls. Yes. R Director Smalley. Yes. Okay. Uh, the next item on the agenda that, oh, that passes, so we will continue to meet in our remote manner. Um, the next is the consent agenda, which is the Board of Directors uh, meeting minutes. Does anybody want to pull this from the consent agenda? Uh, do I have to ask the public whether they want to pull it? Or, uh, no? Pursuant to board yeah. policy, that's appropriate to ask. Yeah, I, th I think that's, I, I agree with you, Holly. I think that's something that we could discuss in the future. I think a lot of other places do not have the public pull things from the consent agenda, but I think the practice has been that they can. So oh, I will I turn read to, differently. Yeah, I will turn to the public and ask whether they, there's anything that they would like to uh comment on here. If not, and nobody wants to pull it, then the consent agenda is approved. Next, we have district reports. Are there any questions or comments on district reports by members of the board? Bob. You know, I, I have a fairly lengthy list, but in the interests of time uh, and with the indulgence, uh, Gail, of yourself and Rick, I can send those to Rick by email, except for one question that I'll ask tonight. Okay. That'd be okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the one question has to do on the engineering report with the um, uh, Felton Heights tank project. Um, I did not see this project on the newsletter project listing. 
and it's been in this sort of you know meta state here for quite some time and i'm trying to get a handle on whether or not this is something that's actually going to proceed anytime soon um i don't understand what the holdup is at this point right now um i'll answer that josh right now we're having difficulty receiving correspondence back from the property owner um, we had good correspondence, district council and myself, and he had some questions. We responded. Um, uh, he was seeking legal counsel to help with him. Uh, I've sent several emails to him, and we have not heard back from him, um, from it, the property owner, I shouldn't call him. It, is the property owner sort of uh, remote, that is, remote to us, does not live here in the, in the valley? That's correct. Uh, well, he... He doesn't live here. He lives up in, I do believe, Palo Alto. Um, and we'll, we're still trying to contact him. I haven't given up on it. He's a busy person. Um, he works in the Stanford Athletic Department, and he's very busy. Um, this isn't his top priority, but obviously it is ours. And I will step up the, the emails to him uh, and try to get a definitive yes or no and we may have to go back to um, uh, an alternative site. Uh, you know, he was very uh, positive. Uh, we, he had a list of concerns. We thought we met those uh, and had uh, responded back to him. Uh, and that's the last uh, we heard from him. Yeah. I mean, as you know, this has been a project that's been outstanding for many years. And... I know the, the folks up in the Felton Heights area kind of want to see this draw to a conclusion one way or the other. Uh, and, you know, this project is more than just a, a tank because it also right. removes uh, uh, a raw water source uh, and it, it lowers our uh, our staff time uh, uh, up yes. in the field. And it's a great project all the way around. So we will yes. step up additional emails, see what we can get from this gentleman. Or even a personal visit, if that's necessary. Yeah, the personal visit is kind of out, but I can I can call him. I do have okay. phone numbers. Okay, great. Thank you. Sir. Appreciate it. Mark. Um, I will follow Bob's lead <clears throat> with the several questions that I have also, and just email those to Rick since we're uh, uh, beyond nine o'clock at this point. But uh, a comment that Rick just made uh, triggered another thought. Um, do we know anybody um, who worked at Stanford previously that might be able to twist this <laughs> athletic director's arm? Guess who was thinking that? Yeah. I, and, and I know somebody else too. Yeah. Um, okay. Rick, let, but, we, but, but that would be inappropriate, I think. Let, let, me, it, let me continue to try to reach out because he's, you know, he's, a, uh, he's very easy to work with, but, you know, you're not going to push him. Um, that's for sure. Let, let me reach out, and as a last resort, I will come back. I, I used to have links with the athletic department, Rick, so I can I can do this in a nice way if it's somebody I know. Right, and I, I think yeah. actually his caretaker, Gail, reached out to you. We can talk about that. It's not yeah, on the agenda, not, yeah. so we'll move yeah. on. Yeah. Okay. 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 Lois? I just have, it's, it's, just kind of a comment. Um, I like to look at the bill pay. And I see that in this bill pay, we had we paid Ernie's Auto Center $13,644 and a few cents. And it, it just seems like did we we go on a rampage and do a lot of work on the trucks? Or what is it? Because there, most of it doesn't say. Some of the little things uh, were like wiper blades or something. And so I don't know. Uh, I, I'm just curious why it would be so much all of a sudden. Uh, the Director of Operations will see what he can inform you Lois and if not we'll get back James it's no big deal yes we had a big ticket item and it was a transmission replacement on one of our dump trucks oh Ooh. okay all right it 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 would have been nice if it would have said you know transmission replacement yeah okay 
thank you for your answer. Are there any uh, questions from members of the public on the district reports? I do want to point out something in my report that the flushing notification to the board is in my report that we will be starting flushing in March. Okay. Thanks for letting us know. All right. Okay. Uh, well, I guess that brings us to uh, item 10, adjournment. So if there's no objection, I will declare us adjourned. And good night. Thank you all for good discussions. Tonight. Thank you. Good night, everyone.